I'm going to call this meeting to order. This is a committee of the whole, and um, we are doing this as a recorded meeting. So uh, personal information, including your image, voice, name, opinions, any other personal information disclosed by you during the meeting is collected by the City of Roslyn under Freedom of Information Protection and Privacy Act for the purpose of your participation in public input or the rest of the meeting. I know we, I think everybody on here uh, as our attendees are part of our, part of our our program today, so probably doesn't matter. But anyway, if anyone doesn't want to be recorded, they should jump off now. And no counselors, that doesn't apply to you. You have it stuck. But um, I'd like to have public input. Is there anybody uh, who is not on the agenda that wants to speak? I think not. So I'm going to go into the adoption of the agenda. Do I have a mover? Terry and Chris is our seconder. All in favor? Okay, and now we're going into our discussions and presentations. And first up is a presentation from WSP on our official community plan, our update for that. So we are turning it over to them and I'm not sure who is the speaker, but it's all you. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Moore and members of council uh, for your time today. I'm just gonna take a moment to introduce our team just in case everyone's not familiar. Uh, so I'm Nola Kilmartin, I'm a senior planner at WSP, and Chen Peng is on the call as well. She's a senior project manager uh, with our team. So Ingrid Liepa, I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Ingrid's from Kimberly. She's our public consultation specialist. Unfortunately, she's double booked today. She's the event coordinator uh, for RDI at Selkirk College, uh, Bridging Silos. Uh, adapting to climate change, it's very mouthful, uh, adapting to cl climate change and low carbon resilience for small communities and rural regions. So um, she apologizes for her absence, but she said they've got over 50 speakers and 200 people registered for the event from all over BC. And uh, she said also of note is that the city of Rossland is a participant in the two year FCM funded climate adaptation capacity building project that the conference is a part of this year that will wind up in June. So. Uh, she thought that was important for us to mention and uh, give give kudos to. So uh, I'm not sure if, if Rachel's going to put the slideshow up or if we should on our end. Uh, Nola, if you like, you can screen share. That's why I made your panelists. So just down the bottom, there's that green Perfect. button and then you can control the slides as you need to there. Okay, fantastic. I apologize. Just give me just one moment to pull that up. Pardon me, pardon me. Ah, oh, the awkwardness of this. Just <laughs> I was going to say, I do have it if it helps you. I, I, I have it on the screen, which I can share if that does help. No, I think we're good now. Awesome. Let me Thank just, you. yep. And I just need to go to the start here. Apologies, I'm just getting some notes up as well. Okay, we are good. We've got our title slide up and everything. Can everybody see the, is it in, is it in presentation mode on your end? We, we see the, the slides on the left and we see the one opening screen in the, in the center. So it's not oh. in presentation. Yeah, it's not in presentation mode. Okay, sorry about that. That's okay. It's this two, two screen business. Let me try again here. Maybe, maybe if, uh, Rachel, if it's okay, maybe we'll do it on your end if that's all right. So, concerned about uh, <laughs> my ability to make this work quickly enough. That should be up there now. Can everyone see my one there? Yep. 
That's great. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. <clears throat> okay, so I think we can skip to yeah the next slide there. So uh, so today we're we're doing a check in uh, basically on the the background and key uh, issue summary that that you were sent and uh, the public engagement plan, uh, the work that's been done to date, and uh, the next steps of that plan. So Chen's going to be filling in for Ingrid and uh, present on the public engagement portion. So we can go on to the, the next slide, it would be great. So we're just going to cover on the OCP update portion of things, the official community plan. Uh, we're going to talk about the review process a little bit, so where we are in the process, the Rosslyn community snapshot that's included in that document, uh, review the plastic past planning work and key issues that we've uncovered as part of this, uh, you know, phase phase two of work out of the six phases to get to our end goal and uh, the technical review summary from our technical team on the engineering side. So let's get to the next slide. So where are we in the process? So as I mentioned, we're, we're, we've got six phases to go through. So before the new year, we had the, the phase one kickoff, just establishing communications and um, scheduling. Uh, we've just wrapped up phase two, which is the background analysis that we're gonna be reporting to you on today. And the kind of preliminary high level kickoff engagement activities. And Ingrid had been working on the public engagement plan development uh, with Stacey and the rest of the team. So we are at the very beginning of phase three, and uh, as we're in the first week of March, and the rest of the month and April will be covering the public engagement events. So it's quite, you know, it looks it looks very lovely and organized at this stage. And if we, we go to the next uh, the next slide, I think you've all worked on projects. You know, it often goes this route where. We're on this pathway from discovery to design. So uh, the, the city of Rossland has an enormous wealth and, and compendium of background documents. So, you know, we've been working through these documents to try to come up with a, a good framework and a good organizational method to, to get us to our, our final design piece. So in a project of this magnitude, where there's a vast amount of information to be gathered and analyzed prior to it all making sense. And, um, you know, we've got important relationships to be developed between the project team and, and the city. The first part of the project can seem a little bit chaotic and unpredictable because the team is getting its footing and uh, trying to figure out what's important and what's not. And feedback from, you know, all aspects of our, our enclosed system are really valuable at this stage. So as the project team gets their footing and, and sees the needs and opportunities and gaps in the system and we start to develop design concepts and prototypes, uh, things are going to start to smooth out. But there will be some failed thought experiments and design dead ends and important refinements through this time. So appreciate you members of uh, Council, so um, uh, Kathy and, and Dirk and Terry on the advisory committee, and I'm sure you understand that well from, uh, from the first few meetings that we've had. Uh, I can pop to the next slide please. Um, so by the time of the, the final design, the noise in the system, you know, it's going to be eliminated and our concepts are going to be honed. And, you know, the overall plan will resonate and be clearly communicated. You can skip to that next uh, slide, Rachel. Thanks. Great. So we can, uh, we can move on to the next one. So who is involved? So Phase one, largely, um, you know, working with Stacy as the, the planning manager and uh, the consultant team. So we've just wrapped up phase two, and that was largely administration, the consulting team, and uh, city council members and the advisory committee. And as I mentioned, a high-level preliminary public engagement survey that Chen will be covering. As we move into phase three, uh, things are getting broader. So city administration, the team, but we're also going to be speaking more uh, in depth to the public and our regional partners as well to, to shape and evolve the OCP. So on to community snapshot. So in the background review uh, dot report, um, we've got a few different topics covered and those were selected because between the the high level public engagement survey and the discussions we've had with the advisor committee, as well as the, um, the city staff, you know, these are some, some important elements of, of life in Rossland. Um, but due to time and interest and importance, uh, we're just going to focus today on the population and growth piece. I think, 
you know, as counselors, you've you've all got a, a good grasp on um, housing and affordability, employment, municipal services, nature and recreation, and uh, culture and heritage. But the population growth piece is quite important, and we're going to have a little discussion time in the session today with you to to get some of your thoughts on this topic. So you go to the next slide. So we've been looking at. Um, two growth scenarios that, that have come out of the, the RDBK and the province. So one scenario sees some incremental growth and the other sees a negative growth. And uh, you know each one is going to Im impact the policy approach and direction and it's going to impact a number of things within, uh, within the OCP update you know, from infrastructure and climate adaptation and community building. So uh, these are important discussion pieces. And, you know, as we move into the next phase and are starting to work on visioning, part of, part of that is going to be having a, a council endorsed uh, growth scenario that um, we, we need all of you on board with and your, your approval of to, to move forward. So you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So some of the some of these growth questions, and um, if you have any notes, please jot them down. And as I said, we'll we'll have about fifteen minutes to to discuss this more. And this slide will come up again if if you miss any of them. But you know, we need to have a have some thought on what is the optimum size of Rossland. Um, how does the pandemic, you know, affect the city from a growth perspective? How does the growth contribute to affordability? Is that's been a big issue that's come up time and time again in most of the interactions our team has had. And you know, how do we how do we plan for infrastructure to support that growth? Next, thank you. So on to the the background review and key issue identification. Um, as I mentioned, you've, uh, the city has done an incredible job of compiling a great library of planning documents, and a lot of them are you know in in the works and implementation as well. Um, our team, in order to organize, this is a different approach because of the, the large amount of background information. Um, we use the strategic sustainability plan in the 11 focus areas as just an initial framework to organize that background information. So our team did a first round review of all the, the documents and looked at some of the gaps that, um, you know, that may exist from, from our view as planning consultants. Um, you know, in terms of carrying carrying Rossland ten years ten years ahead, and so so we did an initial pass on that. Uh, we created a set of workbooks that we reviewed with the advisory committee and did some breakout sessions. And the advisory committee members actually took these workbooks back as you know homework and and filled them out to the best of their abilities or based on their their background and knowledge. Uh, we then reviewed the um, these workbooks with uh, city administration or the planning manager and uh, the advisory committee members. And a lot of the information was summarized in thematic categories. So um, issues, opportunities, and additional work needed. So you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So just as a, a refresh on the focus areas from the sustainable, uh, strategic sustainability plan, um, we, we use these because, you know, there are fewer categories, they're fairly simple for most people to understand, and uh, the the current OCP had, you know, it had about, you know, 17 categories, um, so this just, just made uh, organization a little bit easier, um, as these are general OCP topics as well that are, that are often used. So you can go to the next. So some of the, the highlights that came out of the workbook summary discussion are, you know, so overarching sort of category is the, the scope of the use in the organization. Um, there were a lot of comments about, you know, this has to be an effective tool that serves different audiences. Um, you know, these key issues and gaps emerged about regulations, infill, and how that relates to affordability and housing. Um, as well as housing diversity. Uh, recreation is obviously very important at the forefront of a lot of people's minds in, in the city. And uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of recommendations for the focus areas to be tweaked in the wording. So I think that was, that was largely agreed upon by everybody. And you know, some, some focus areas like sense of community and governance and intergenerational care and learning were thought of as more of a principle than a, than a section of the OCP. 
So we're still at the early stage here. So, you know, we didn't want to get too much into the weeds on all this, but it's more just to compile the information so we keep it in mind as we get into to policy development in the next phase. So we can go on to the next one. So another kind of theme that came out was the, the interrelationships and the impacts. So climate uh, and sustainability is a very important one but also understanding how that impacts uh, cost of living and affordability of residents um, is another big consideration. And uh, a lot of the discussion in the first advisory committee meeting um, that I was involved in was heavily focused on community engagement and making sure we had a really good understanding of a cross-section of community needs and that we weren't just getting feedback from you know, a, certain, a certain element of, of the community. Uh, there's also, you know, in a lot of mountain towns, there's the, the desire for recreation and development along with conservation of the natural environment that brought everybody there in the first place is very important. And uh, a good amount of focus, which isn't, isn't really common, to be honest, is on, on municipal assets and asset management and how you link that to, to some of the other uh, policy areas and, you know, and um, things that impact Rosslanders like growth and taxes, and that needs to re receive some more attention. So to, just to kind of high level sum up some of these key OCP issues and gaps, again, it's the, the growth and taxes. I think I sound like a bit of a broken record, but uh, the housing options and diversity. Um, the question of how do you support incremental development to ensure you, know, you don't have a you know, mass kind of lot consolidation and large scale uh, development come in, but how do you make it an affordable and attractive option to those who are looking to do smaller, um, smaller size bills? And looking at attracting remote workers and employment, diversifying employment opportunities, especially in consideration of the last year and the impact it's had on tourism. Um, enhancing policies in the OCP for all art forms, culture, and heritage, because the focus can lean a little too heavy onto to the recreation side of things. Um, having so just said that, there is a desire for a recreation master plan that has a regional approach, and also desire for general improvements to transportation options um, in Rossland and within the region. So uh, I'm almost done my piece, but onto the technical review summary. So um, I think most of you know Elise who lives in Rossland. So, so Elise produced the section on climate change and resiliency. So I'm just gonna highlight, she, she wrote a thorough report, but um, it's quite technical. So I'm just gonna focus on the next steps piece. Um, some of the, the next steps she recommended are to, to opera, operationalize the existing plans, Focus on efforts where incentives can be leveraged. Look at uh, you know the existing policies and, and come to turn, you know come to a decision on which ones are in conflict with each other. And set goals and targets that could be embedded in the zoning bylaw. And uh, you know start using green infrastructure, or natural assets as actual assets within the asset management plan. Um, and then also, you know, back to back to these topics of climate and the impacts on affordability and looking at life cycle costs and, you know, make infrastructure decisions based on based on a multi-factor assessment. So on to transportation. Um, there was uh, one of our transportation engineers who deals a lot in policy uh, drafted that section, which is in the report as well. So the recommendations are to develop strategies to enhance active transportation and integrate, you know, all modes between transit and, you know, bus service walking, um, car share programs. There's a lot of discussion about electrical vehicles as well now. Um, looking at regional coordination and determining where investment is possible, where it's required to address those connections and establishing priority focus areas for the transportation network. And last one is, is infrastructure. So the, the GIS information Rosslyn has is, is excellent. The inventory of infrastructure assets, um, but at the moment uh, it outlines the, the general costs of replacement. Um, what, is, what would be needed is um, 
an, a plan that would identify the improvements and in investment recommendations to achieve city goals and objectives. So having some alignment with streetscape improvements or areas where multifamily housing would be permitted and encouraged and um, you know how that relates to to fire flows as well. So there's just um, you know a bit of a need identified for a strategic plan for for the infrastructure side of things, and uh, you know that'll identify where those requirements will align with those higher level priorities. Okay, so on to the next is um, so what we came came down to from at this stage. And uh, again, we, you know, these things can be, can be tweaked, but uh, the criteria for the consultation topics and policy development, um, major themes kind of emerged as lenses by which to evaluate and consider policies and, uh, you know, how we look at implementation as well. So key things are adapting to the future. And so that, that's to encompass sustainability and climate and um, resiliency. Uh, affordability and housing and, and cost of living are, are really important factors. Um, you know, natural environment implications and, uh, you know, and looking at things through a lens of, of community and sense of community. So now I think we're going to go on to some of the, those growth questions. Uh, we've got the slide with the questions on it right after this one. Um, so Chen, I've been talking a long time. I just want to see if uh, there are any initial questions or, or Chen, do you want to frame this, this discussion piece? Yep. Yep. So uh, good morning. Uh, so I'm, uh, I got two portions here. So this, this one is about the discussion on the growth questions and the other one, I will give you uh, some updates on the engagement activities after. So uh, for this part, uh, for this uh, discussion on the growth, this questions, we're not looking at direction or anyhow, but this is really the first time that based on the uh, background review that we had, that knowledge is introduced. And this is the question we figured out that this is really a fundamental question that we wanna ask everybody about, um, about how you think about the growth. Um, Rachel, do you mind go back to the slides that with the two sets of number, um, which is slice 10, I believe. Yeah. Oh, sorry. One more down back. Yeah, this one. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. Okay. One more slide down. Yes. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so what this is, we were, um, growth is a fundamental factors and how we, uh, how we kind of uh, tailored our uh, OCP. Uh, policies. So we got two sets of scenario here. So first one is based on the most uh, recent one, the RDK, uh, RDKB, uh, the, region, uh, the Regional Housing Needs Report. So basically uh, in that report it says in the next 10 years that um, Rosslyn are looking at um, the population is shrinking a little bit. And also this uh, another set of number not including in this slide is there may be a slightly more um, dwelling units needed because uh, household size going down. So that's the, that's the whole information, whole sets of information there. So this is one scenario. And the other one in 2019, uh, BC province, the province did a population projection uh, throughout the whole province for the next 20 years. So till 2041. Um, so based on that information, they had a growth rate between uh, annually 1% to 2%-ish. That's, uh, that's the calculation base. So they kind of have a different set of criteria how to determine this growth rate. So based on their number that is still fairly new, I would say 2019, um, that shows that uh, raw, uh, we use that average growth scenario and apply to Rossland scenario. So this is the number we're getting. It seems like, yes, according to the average growth rate across BC province, uh, we're getting um, 618 people uh, more like um, in next 10 years, which 
is totally different um, direction here. So when we see the number, if, if we're shrinking, then maybe we really don't need to talk a lot about how we're going to develop uh, new housing in the next 10 years um, based on the uh, regional housing needs report. But based on the BC uh, provincial uh, number, then we are we probably have to kind of figure out is we might have like 100, 200 houses, 200 houses probably, two to 300 houses, new houses that um, add to new uh, Rossland in the next 10 years. Um, and just further on, uh, the numbers I didn't put into this slide is get to 2041, then we're looking at a 30% increase in the population. So that's definitely even more con uh, conversation that we will have. But just comparison like this um, regional MPC number that representing two scenario. So I wanna bring this to your attention. Um, Rachel, do you mind go to the slides we just have with the questions there? Slides 25, let me see. Um, 25. Um, or 24 or 25. No, no she's, Going down. she's on it. Okay. Sorry, but this is online. Probably it's a little bit dragging. So... Um, I want to, so this few questions, it's still, we think it's important question, and this is what will be discussed further with uh, uh, another stakeholder workshop that happening later in a couple of weeks. But we want to hear how you think about it is, except for talking about numbers, quantifying the growth, is what's, what is the multiple uh, odds? Ultimate size of Rossland. So that's the first one we want to know that how you think about it. What's the most appropriate size for Rossland? I would just open the floor that let people discuss. Okay, so Chen um, Stuart has a comment, and we'll just we'll just go. People put their hands up, and we can chat. Go ahead, Stu. Yeah, I just wanted to say those uh, projections are pretty useless. I think we've already talked about them in previous meetings. Um, they don't really reflect what we're what we're dealing with. Um, you know, we the, the short answer is we actually don't know what we're dealing with. You know, those of us that have been here for a while have seen boom and bust cycles in growth, and we don't know if we're in a in a boom, which will be followed by a, a bust, and it may average out to to slow growth over time, or perhaps we are at the beginning of a of a ramping up. And we, we can see lots of comparable examples of communities that have become you know, a lot more expensive and a lot more developed through people wanting to move there for the lifestyle, facilitated by technological growth and, and high cost of living in other communities. So we, we just don't know, you know are, we, are we ramping up endlessly or are we at a, a short-term peak? But we're definitely experiencing growth right now. And I think whatever we do, we need to be, we need to be measuring what's happening in both those directions and be adaptable. We don't want to be placing a limit on development. If things get worse and then where our economy is depressed, we want to be flexible, but we also don't want to be, you know, basing it or you know, naively planning for long, slow, steady growth when we're ramping up into unaffordability. So, you know, I mean, that's, that's the short answer. Um, there's obviously a lot of complex things that come into calculating these, these things and what we're going to measure to, to determine where we are. Um, and I also don't think that, you know, the size of the community is, is, the, is the appropriate measure. You know, they're, they're more things like, what is the demand? The demand that is gonna be pushing up on affordability is, is more of a concern. And things like, you know, community turnover. I mean, it's, you know, we, we might stay the same size, but if everybody that's living here now has been priced out and we've been completely displaced by a whole new bunch of richer people, you know, the, the community is not going to be the same and we're not going to achieve our goals. So, you know, a lot of these considerations around gentrification are the ones that, that I'd like to see addressed. Okay, I think Andy had his hand up. I think uh, excellent points that Stu brought up, but I also um, wondered um, with, with the WSP's work provincially, uh, you know, the, the discrepancy in those two estimates, the 
estimate for, for a reduction in population and a substantial increase in population uh, over the next while. Um, certainly brought a lot of questions to the regional district table when the report uh, came out. Uh, already across the district, um, certainly since the pandemic, there's been substantial uh, notice uh, in, our, in our small communities of people uh, migration in. So um, we thought the pandemic has likely changed all, all scenarios that were previously predicted. So just wondering, as WSP noted, and in their expertise, can they give us a guesstimate as to what the impact's going to be for the next few years? I mean, the trend, the trend is there. And I'm just wondering, you know, can you guys give us some realistic projections of what you think growth is likely to be mm -hmm. outside of, you know, what we've received thus far? We, can I just to answer that question that, um, yes, we noticed the difference. And uh, also in other municipalities, and uh, we've heard also they are not super agree with what the region come up with in terms of housing needs report. Uh, you are not the only one, definitely. Um, so the growth there sounds like is quite I mean, uh, quite a few municipalities, they confirmed, they feel like they have actually experienced more growth than uh, what the actual number is. And even compared to the provincial number, the, the provincial number, it shows positive, but uh, it seems they are experiencing higher than that. That, that's what I've heard. And they talk about a lot about uh, economic development and also where's where is the room to growth? Um, so that that definitely is a trend. I'm not sure how much we can quantify this, how this pandemic affecting um, uh, Rossland or uh, even this uh, municipality beside you. Um, but we would like to, that's why we kind of bring this up uh, for discussion is how, how that affecting um, and uh, that back to the first question is what's the most appropriate size of Rossland and that probably matters more in that way. I'm gonna call on Terry. Terry has his hand up. Um, thanks. Um, so I wanna build on a couple things that Stu brought up and um, I think a little differently. So one of the things that I've um, starting to appreciate is uh, um, again, in, in sort of my 40 years plus here, I've seen blips. Um, so I wouldn't call them boom and bust, but Rawson's been on a, on a fairly steady growth and certainly um, real estate prices have, have been climbing and dramatically in the last little while. So the issue of affordability is, is uh, uh, an interesting one. However, um, just on the work that I've been doing with um, Janice looking over her shoulder across the whole province um, things have been going up so while uh, you know if you were just at a Rawson lens you'd be gasping your breath I think no matter um, you know where a young family for example wanted to settle they were going in in British Columbia um, you know the the relative value of real estate and across Canada for that matter is is going up so um, I, I think we're moving in parallel uh, in terms of affordability with um, the rest of the province. So I just wanted to put that out there. But then, um, uh, you know, the optimum size, one of the things that I worry, one of the things that, that uh, we love about this town is, it, is how it's centrally sort of packaged. Um, I think we're one of about four or five communities that I know that doesn't have a strip, like so Revelstoke and... Um, Revelstoke and Nelson have these nice compact um, downtown cores, and I and I don't like the idea of uh, trying to fit another, you know, fifteen hundred people into our downtown core because unless we develop a whole other commercial area, so optimum size, um, we keep bashing around the five thousand number, and um, Jen, just based on your, that means two to three hundred new houses, given smaller family sizes and things like that. That's kind of concerning to me, actually. Um, uh, I'm trying to think about where two or three hundred more houses in our town would go, and it makes me kind of, and, and what what um, going for groceries at Furrows would look like. So uh, that's a concern. 
Okay, we've got some counselors that haven't spoken yet. Anybody want to get on this question? Janice. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, I know that the RDKB, mm -hmm. I guess with the forecasts, I'm just thinking about um, what I learned in, the, in uh, early January when I got a read an economic forecast put out by Central One, which is, uh, you know, does uh, the economic forecasting for all the um, credit unions. And what I didn't realize is that when they forecast growth for the Kootenai areas, it's always been a little lower than the rest of um, the rest of the province, but it includes the East Kootenai, the West Kootenai and the boundary area. So, you know, as the East Kootenai, Cranbrook, that area, West Kootenai, Nelson up north, and then the boundary area. So the East Kootenai is about 40% of what they're counting. The West Kootenai is another 40%. The boundary is only 20%. And then we're like this little tiny community in the boundary. So, you know, we could double in size and we wouldn't really move the whole mm -hmm. Kootenai forecast at all. Um, it, and, you know, even if we're, even if, uh, so that's the challenge with looking at those bigger forecasts. We have to understand what's happening in our community. Um, and then, you know, we're talking about, um, I know we keep talking about houses because we have so many single family houses, but I think we need to think of it more in terms of housing units. So, yes. yeah, it's, uh, you know, and, and I read the background or you guys have 2.4 people per housing unit. I thought the census said 2.3, not that that's a big difference, but, uh, you know, if we're adding 40 and we're using the 5,000 sort of guideline, I'm not really fixed on how big, big or small we need to be as long as we can remain, re retain our community feel. But, you know, if our um, Midtown project goes ahead, if we continue to grow at the same rate we have, in four years, we're halfway to, we're going to be halfway to um, that 5,000 from where we're at now. So, you know, we may be seeing, we can't forecast exactly moving forward. We may have a bit of an exponential growth going on, or it may flatten out and be a little more stable, or it could drop again. We don't know, uh, but I think we have to plan for any one of those, um, any one of those results as best we can. Sometimes that's all you can do. Professor Dirk? I think, uh, I think what we need uh, is a little bit more inventory here. So, you know, I look at the population we have now and I think we're going to grow organically um, by 100 to 200 people in the next four years-ish. Um, you know, so kind <clears> of, <throat> excuse me, ob obtaining balance within our community of, of everything, both affordable, uh, rental, um, and, uh, and some of the houses that, that some of the people are coming, um, they're going to desire. So, um, we're going to have a tough time keeping up, I think, with just in, in the, our capacity to be able to, to build enough for, for people, in my opinion. Dirk? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, uh, echo Stu's concerns about growth and affordability, but realistically I think the only thing we can control is the cost of living here real estate prices I'm sure are going to go up and that really only matters if we're leaving and then who can come back in to fill our spaces um, I don't know how you I, I'm with everybody that I don't think we can get too big because then we lose the community um, I don't know how to control that without spiking you know realty costs or keeping them down by letting our community sprawl so it's I don't really know mm -hmm. I, something something to consider I mean there are predominantly single family homes in in Rossland and like most communities in BC you know those homeowners are are aging and maybe looking to to downsize so as as people shift into maybe multifamily units um, that are perhaps more easily accessible and easier to maintain and care for and maybe a bit more affordable that provides them some some income in their retirement, um, you know, those homes and lots will will come available. And so uh, what I was mentioning earlier about incremental infill, and so not losing the feel and the look and the the aesthetic of the, the design of housing in in town is, um, you know, having having splits like 
going to semi-detached housing or um, having some, you know, triplex units or, or fourplexes or something along those lines, um, you know, where you could have, you know, a family living, to, living together in the same units. And so um, that doesn't require that additional land component, but it, it allows, uh, you know, the scale to stay the same. Uh, what often happens in places where, you know, you don't plan for this and you don't um, allow your infrastructure to support it because it's cost prohibitive for, for small scale builders to, to do infill is uh, you get somebody with the money to come in, purchase those properties that are getting run down, do a lot consolidation, and they have to sit and hold and wait. And then that ultimately can result in a much larger scale development project um, that usually causes quite a bit of upset in town. And those developers want to make money, so they're going to be, um, you know, looking for for higher value or higher cost per square foot, and so that also negatively affects the affordability aspect. So just just some things to to consider, um, you know, to uh, to Janice's point, it's not all like additional houses; it's just you know, adjusting the housing mix effectively as you go forward. Well, those are the tools that we have too, right? Land use, how, how we use our land and the policies that we put in place, which is, you know, part of what we're talking about here. You know, I mean, for me, the optimum size of Roslyn is not too much bigger than it is now because we don't have a lot of land ourselves. We don't want, I don't think we want to do boundary expansion. We have, that's sort of been around the block a few times and it's not been well received. We don't want sprawl. Um, we like our compact community and, you know, you're going to run into parking problems or as Terry said, you know, crowding in the, in the grocery store and all that. So, you know, so the real, the real issue is how do you keep it affordable and yet slow growth, you know? And I, I absolutely agree with the provincial projections more than the regional, the regional housing thing in terms of where we see our, our growth going. I mean, we are seeing growth. Um, and as Janice pointed out, I mean, we're a blip, we're a blip on that study. We don't even show up. We could have dramatic growth and, and not even show up in those, uh, that, you know, regional thing. So that's okay. You want to get on to your next question? Sure. So, yeah, I, I guess we talk about the first and second now. I just want to, uh, see your points about growth, like pros and cons, um, I also understand you touched the affordability a little bit, and actually in the later slide, uh, slide slides that are actually showing the uh, survey result, the preliminary survey result, affordability is one of the most, I would say it is almost the top topics there. Um, so I'm just wondering how this growth will contribute to affordability or actually negative, positive, pros and cons. That's um, also, that's one something I want to bring it to the table for a discussion. Who wants to start with that one? Janice. I think that, uh, you know, growth will come with both. I mean, uh, you know, in theory, um, expanding our tax base, regardless of how we expand that, um, should mean that, uh, you know, if we add another 100 people, that should spread some of the cost out, or 100 units, housing units, that should spread some of the cost out amongst all our units. Uh, but we also have, you know, as we add units, we also increase our cost to service. Um, so the balancing act is to try and grow those units that we need that will be in demand um, without having to invest in huge additional infrastructure to support either those units or the people who are going to come and live in it. Um, so we are a high serviced, highly serviced community now. Uh, which is probably one of the reasons that we're so attractive to people. Um, and uh, so, but, you know, of course, there is invisible infrastructure, the infrastructure people don't think about uh, that is necessary to be maintained and even expanded to support additional housing or housing units. So that could be water, sewer, um, sanitary, uh, electrical, broadband, all those things that... Um, that, uh, you know, those are going to be initial expenses um, or maybe initial expenses, but are, are, you know, if we can, I think as council, if we're looking at uh, where our infrastructure can support more growth, then we should focus on trying to put the growth where our infrastructure already is, and that helps us to minimize our future costs. 
Yeah, good point. Um, Terry has his hand up, then Stu. Um, thanks, Kathy. Uh, two things. Um, we want to have, uh, we want to support um, schools in our town. And that, that uh, so again, I think uh, schools are a, a major contributor to livability. So I think growth, um, you know, we've lived through uh, a horrible last decade where schools were shut down and um, it, it really caused disruption. So that's one, um, one pro for um, having enough uh, kids around and young families to uh, sustain schools and retail, I, I would put uh, to a lesser degree, but um, you know, our retailers downtown um, had some tough years. I think, uh, I, I believe they're doing better now, but um, th that's another reason why we wanna have some modest growth or certainly not, don't wanna backslide in population. Stu? Yeah, I just think it's, uh... Um, at the type of growth matters. You know, if we have a moderate amount of growth that's socioeconomically diverse, then that, that's going to make our community more affordable um, by definition. Um, but if growth is, you know, trophy homes at the ski hill and, you know, wealthy retirees and, you know, short-term rentals, um, that, that's, that's not going to give take us in the direction we want. So, you know, it's about incentivizing the type of development and the, and the type of, of growth that we want rather than, you know, arbitrarily setting limits. If we just say, oh, we're not gonna have any more houses in Roslyn, well then people are still gonna wanna come here and they're still gonna drive up the price of individual properties and, the, and the reduce the diversity even more. Okay, who else? Andy, Andy. I'll, I'll, uh, I guess I, I feel similarly to what was previously said, but also note that um, uh, originally the development at the ski hill was mostly about uh, rental and, and seasonal usage. And it, it has expanded into, into uh, some permanent uh, year round uh, residence. But I certainly know that the build out capacity of the ski hill is substantially bigger than what it is now. And, you know, the, I don't, seven, what can you, I can't remember the 7,000 beds or whatever. Um, 13,500, Andy. Sorry, what was it, Stu? 13,500. Right. Now, so yeah, currently zoned. Right. So I think, I think that has to be really seriously looked at, uh, you know, that's kind of unfettered growth that, that doesn't, doesn't align with where our community uh, needs and wishes to be, I believe. Um, uh, but um, the, the importance of maintaining the core of the community, and as Terry had pointed out, it's really critical that I, I don't wish to see us expand the footprint of our community. Uh, you know, Redstone to the south uh, or east and, and the mountain to the west work and, and live within that capacity. Um, and, I'm, and I'm already concerned about our infrastructure uh, capacity because I think you know, we've talked about sewers, our, our, our current underwater, our underground capacity, but also I think about uh, climate change and, and our water availability. Uh, that's going to be a critical uh, issue that I think we really have to keep top of mind as well uh, in the next few years. How, you know, we've been successful in reducing our, our water needs in our community by metering and education, uh, but I think that um, the water is still a critical issue that, that has to be uh, uh, factored into what our potential growth capacity is as well. Okay. Dirk. Yeah, I don't really have much to add. I agree 100% with Stu on, you know, diversity, just making sure we have a diverse community as it grows. And that's where our power lies in trying to manage the, you know, the affordability and desirability of the community. Okay. Chris. One of the things that I've no, noticed is uh, how strict regulations uh, and on development, it'll drive the price up um, for the land itself, which will slow things down inevitably. Um, so the more strict we are on what we have, the, I think the slower the process of building will, will be. Um, but to that point, there are a lot of lots, even at the at the golf course, that are uh, are available. So we'll see how that happens. 
Yeah, that's that's true. There are there are quite a few lots available at, at the golf course and at Red, which kind of goes to you know Stuart's point of of you know what's what's available up there. I mean, to Andy's point about water, we do have a large capacity of water under the current climate because we have two reservoirs, which are more than adequate to serve our population. But thinking of the future is where we could you know run into some some issues up there, and you know. Janice was talking about, well, we get some more houses and then we share the cost. But unfortunately, we haven't seen that. As we've ha added houses as, and as we've grown, our costs continue to grow because we continue to provide all the services and the costs mm -hmm. of that increase. So, I mean, I always thought, yeah, okay, we, we get a few more houses, we spread, we spread the taxation wider, but it hasn't actually resulted in our taxes, you know, going down. So, uh, Stuart. Yeah, can I suggest as we become a more affluent community, the demands of residents sort of rise to, to meet the, you know, the increased capacity. So it doesn't, doesn't get cheaper to live here. It just gets more and more expensive all the time as, as wealthy and wealthier people have greater needs. Yeah, that's what we've seen. I just have a, a question for discussion and in, in terms of the balance between the tourist population and the, the permanent population and what your thoughts are on that, like how, how that impacts um, cost of living and finances and um, changes you've seen over time in terms of the, the number of those, uh, the tourist population increases and, and how that Im impacts your operations. Okay, who wants to start on that? Stuart? Yeah, I, mean, I think we all welcome tourism as a, as a part of a healthy mix in our community. And it's just, you know, we probably have all our own individual perspectives on what that balance should be. Um, you know, the, you know, but, but some of us have concerns that that might get out of whack. I mean, we do know, you know, Roslyn still feels like a community of residents with a, you know, a bit of tourism as a, as a supplement to that. Um, if, if that tourism was to grow to the point where it dwarfed the permanent population, then it would have a completely different character in the community. And those of us that value it as it is would, would not like that. So, you know, 13,500 beds feels like it would dwarf the, the residential community. Yeah. Who else? Ken. Uh, sorry, I just uh, uh, adding another question up to that. I just uh, noticed that yes, we we well past our fifteen disc uh, minutes discussion, but this is really helpful uh, discussion though. So let let's maybe stand it for another few minutes. So my question is. Um, Yep, just based on we had this, uh, we have other projects that are related to some fiscal impact analysis uh, in terms of growth. So uh, uh, some actual real numbers kind of showing that uh, residential uh, definitely uh, is a little bit higher, actually more higher than to maintain uh, compared to commercial and de uh, industrial development. So uh, because residential, a lot of uh, re um, yeah, a lot of costs associated with that. And for industrial and commercial, they are a lot less expense. So many municipalities use that as a tool, like to balance the uh, residential and uh, non-residential tax uh, base and also land planning that to kind of get them to uh, lower down the uh, tax uh, to a certain level, just basically use the non-residential uh, tax income to help with residential expenses and all that. So it's obvious there, sorry, um, I my question to, uh, to the board right now is um, what types of economic development tax base that you are uh, you thinking is fit into uh, Rossland like so this is this uh, talking I understand that the retail just based on what we had discussed retail seems not a uh, not unlimited this uh, this is a certain market to fit into so we're not kind of like uh, just r uh, randomly to add more commercial space then we get more that just doesn't work in that way. So in terms of industrial, we're not definitely not looking at any heavy industrial or any even um, middle level industrial, uh, maybe be a business park or office, somehow that types of use can fit into Rossland that uh, scenario. And also tourism is one of them. So I'm just uh, curious uh, about with the board is what types of a non-residential development that you think is more appropriate for Rosland context. Okay, 
Okay, so we have very limited uh, land for commercial or light industrial. We, we, we're limited there. So regardless of what we want, we don't have a lot of space for it unless we talk about boundary expansion, which I don't think we're talking about. But the, the first question that we, we only got one response on was about the tourist population versus the full-time residents. So if you want to hear from the board on that, maybe we can have, when I call on each of you, you can talk about your feelings about tourism and then address Chen's question about what other yeah. kinds of of businesses we'd like to see. We have just struck an economic development um, task force for Roslyn of uh, some people and they're they're looking, you know, at, at some of these ideas. They're just getting started. Okay, Andy, you had your hand up after Stuart. Um, Stuart's already answered the, the tourism. Sure. Work. Let's go around. Okay, so um, yeah, I think Stuart ha handled the tourism part and I would, I would concur with what he had to say. Uh, as far as uh, other commercial business or uh, industrialization of some sort, um, you know, the, what we, the limited amount we do have uh, has expanded recently. Um, it's, you know, it's self-storage. It's uh, someone who's, who's recognized the, the market in, um, in uh, uh, cannabis edibles, who, who started to do uh, some commercial expansion. Um, it's a um, you know, welding, uh, enterprise uh, fabrication welding shop that's doing quite well out there uh, with with a small business venture. Uh, it's probably it's going to be um, uh, again very community based uh, businesses that see a market locally. Uh, again, because of space, I think they're not going to be able to expand much. And then, and as pointed out by Terry earlier, the retail will expand. I think as demands noted and and what people are willing to take a chance. Retail is a tricky one. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, I had I have a retail background as well, and it's it's just the market is so sensitive to to that. So I think that'll expand or detract relative to demand. Um, and of course, uh, home businesses. And we talked about uh, the uh, fact that during the pandemic, a lot of people are working from home, and I think that's going to be a reality uh, for the next. Ever, I mean, it, it's likely not going to go back to what it was. Uh, so our community has benefited from a lot of young families moving into the community, where people uh, saw the opportunity to re work remotely and expand uh, their business, either independent businesses or they work for others, larger corporations that are that are in large urban centers and they can work uh, remotely. So that's you know, from a business venture uh, standpoint, I think that's good growth for our community. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's what we're likely going to continue to support and encourage here. Great. Okay, Chris has his hand up. I want you guys, we're going to have to move a little more quickly to keep on schedule here, but I, I want to hear from everybody. So, Chris. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I'm not convinced that, that attracting home-based businesses is a is going to help us in our economic landscape. Um, I really like your point, um, Andy, about uh, our light commercial area. And I think if there's an argument for any more boundary ex extensions, um, it would be towards uh, uh, expanding the light commercial area. I think that's where going to be our, our largest opportunity for, for commercial growth here. Um, retail is, is saturated. There's nothing available. Um, and each one of the retail stores are, are holding their own. They seem to be doing uh, okay, especially in a, in a climate like we have now. Um, tourism will always remain to remain our largest industry here um, until the ski hill goes away or people just decide to stop traveling for fun. Um, I think it'll still be our, our largest uh, opportunity for, for economic uh, development here locally. So. Um, but I'm not convinced that that attracting home-based businesses is is necessarily uh, our right avenue. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's see who hasn't spoken on this. Terry and Dirk. Yep. Just thanks, Kathy. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see uh, that light light industrial area uh, continue to grow and infill out there. I think that's a, it's a key piece and provides some blue collar uh, or, or some or some even some high tech uh, 
work out there. I, and Chris, I, I guess I just, uh, um, my only question there to you is uh, what's wrong with home-based businesses? So um, I'd love to hear what's different about that, that just to I can hold that. I don't think anything's wrong with it. Uh, I just don't think it's, it's a future for, you know, trying to change our tax base here. I think our houses are going to be filled regardless. I think we need to, if we're talking about um, balancing our contribution to the city from a commercial level, um, I think we need to, to actually have commercial. Okay, Dirk and then Stu. Yeah, I think, it, can everybody hear me? I got a note that my mic is not working, that's better. Um, yeah, I, I think tourism, as much as we sort of depend on it, but we've seen over the last year how risky that is. So I think tourism is kind of a nice icing on a really cool Rossum cake. Um, we've got bad snow years or bad smoke or some other, I don't know, pandemic. Um, so it's risky to build that into sort of a planned future. It's the icing. I, I like the idea of an increase in the light industrial. I've seen that grow and I know there's demand for it. Um, I don't know, there's empty properties out there, so it doesn't really need to expand at this point. And then uh, I don't know what the options are for home-based business. I mean, that's the I'm one and uh, the, the options to tax those differently. Uh, I don't know if that stands out or, I mean, I, I don't wanna get shot over that, but you know, the, I think there are some options. It's a, it's a commercial enterprise, so. Okay. Stu and then Janice. Yeah, I just think uh, remote workers are a really significant part of our of growth in our community. Um, you know, and it's just a way of understanding the growth and changes we're we're seeing. You know, um, you know, prior to technology making it, you know, convenient to live here, Rosen was a pretty remote place, and you know, it was. We had a high quality of life, but it was very affordable because you had to make all sorts of sacrifices to be here. You couldn't buy things on Amazon. You didn't couldn't read the New York Times online. It was remote and it was cheap because of that. And every year technology makes it easier and easier to live in these remote communities. And it's making it easier and easier for people to relocate their work here. And, and you know, without us attracting it, it's still happening and it's driving up the price of of real estate in town and, and decreasing our affordability. Um, and uh, I mean, we, we are challenged because it doesn't increase our tax base in the same way that more traditional businesses would, but it's happening and it's going to continue to happen. And I, I, it'll be, oh, I'm open to all sorts of ideas, how we can, you know, take advantage of it, but mm -hmm. you know, wishing it, wishing it away is not going to change it. This is a trend that's happening and it's affecting our community in lots of ways. Janice. Okay. Um, yeah, in terms of tourism, I think that, um, you know, tourism has actually been one of our largest economic drivers over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and not in, uh, not in terms of uh, salaries or economic money that's come into town, but actually in terms of people it's brought to town. So, you know, I always say that uh, I, came, I came to ski, but I stayed for the community. And, uh, you know, what attracted me to actually move here was not because I was moving to a resort and it had great skiing, uh, but because of the amazing community we have. So um, as far as economic development goes, you know, the challenge with tourism is, as an industry, uh, is that it relies on people having a disposable income. And so, it, again, you know, it's attracting people with disposable income to come to visit. They see the great community. They move here. They have disposable income to start with. And so that sort of goes to Stu's comment about, you know, increasingly more affluent people moving into town. It provides uh, the community with some great amenities and quality of life. It's not a really high paying, um, not a really high paying industry overall. So I'm with Dirk on the icing on our Roslyn cake. I think it provides us with a lot of really great um, amenities. Great people come and visit us, uh, but it's not necessarily something we need to rely on. As far as home-based businesses go, even though it doesn't expand our tax base currently, um, what it does do is if we have people who are working at home, living in the community full-time, it does increase our stability and sustainability. So they're here with their families, they're working, 
Uh, it doesn't change uh, from, from a city economic development point of view, it doesn't change our tax base, but it does make the tax base we have possibly more stable. Um, and then, yeah, I agree. You know, we, we need to look at, um, we need to look at having some of those non-residential, growing some of that non-residential uh, property revenues through taxation, whether it's through expansion or balancing our uh, tax policies to help so to help um, support the residents that have been carrying the bulk of the bulk of the uh, costs over time. So you know, light industrial growth, light manufacturing maybe consider rezoning some of our residential properties to more commercial type, commercial or light manufacturing, um, inobtrusive things that wouldn't necessarily disrupt our neighborhoods. Uh, that would help to expand that base there. Yeah, I, I agree with Janice's comments there. And certainly with the build out of the light industrial that we do have, you know, we do have some, and as mentioned, it isn't fully subscribed yet, and, and it could be, which would, which would be great. The other thing, um, the home-based businesses, Yes, they do. They, they contribute to the stability of the community, but they also provide customers for all our bricks and mortar shops. And tourism does that as well. I mean, you look at the shops in Roslyn, and I don't think we'd have the variety of shops that we have if we didn't have tourists. So there has to be that balance. And I really appreciate Stu's comments. We don't want to be dwarfed by them. So there has to be that balance. And we can do as much of that as possible through land use regulation. Um, you know, that's probably the best, the best lever that we have. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Andy comments with kids for the schools too, when you have the home-based business people, which is, which is critical. We don't want to lose any more schools. Right now our schools are overflowing. So that's, that's another problem. And, and, and here's the other thing. We talked to the thought exchange people in the economic development task force thing, and they were talking about they're a growing company that their people all work remotely and they actually don't require people to live in Roslyn anymore because people can't find housing. So those are families that are living somewhere else. Those are families whose kids are in other community schools and shop in other communities' businesses, so. Okay. All right. So thank you very much. That was a, I was going to do a, a sum up, but I think between Janice and Kathy's comments, you both <laughs> are, Excellent orators and summarize that very well. So thank you very much for that discussion. Um, if it's okay with everyone, I think we'll need to, to move on to the, the public engagement. So uh, Chen will be yeah. zipping through that piece. Does anybody need a, a short break or anything like that? Or is everybody okay? Just get done so I can go skiing. All right. Well, good. enough said. All right. Chen, keep it brief. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Not a problem at all. Um, so, so the rest portion is actually it's a, a quick summary of what, what, what we have done uh, for the, uh, uh, the preliminary survey and also what's going on with our uh, PEP PAP, um, public engagement plan, and then also what's the next steps. Um, so I would do a little bit more quick, uh, yeah, quick conversation, uh, sorry, a quick introduction of what's happening with the preliminary survey. Um, so let's, let's do that. Okay. So we do have actually receive a three, 335 response, which is about 20%, a little bit shy on 20% um, of the households, just based on the assumption that one person per household that will respond to this uh, uh, survey. So uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty good considering it's preliminary. Um, and then we'll have a more comprehensive survey coming up later. So that's uh, uh, in April. So anyway, we asked three, eight questions there. So the first one is basically a vision for Rosslyn. So what we, uh, how we come up this uh, statistic number is, is based on the keyword uh, search of the uh, open-ended response and related to the numbers of times that particular word got mentioned. Um, so 30 keywords were searched and then uh, so as you see, this is the root uh, affordability. Um, also, uh, that's the, always the top one. And then uh, the small diverse, that's definitely sounds like it's quite common feeling about Roslyn. Um, yeah, and then um, sustainable housing and that's all sort of uh, hot topics there. Uh, Rachel, can you go to the next one? 
yes, um, this is somehow similar, but it's different is what's the most important issue about OCP, like um, what, what they think. So number one, the top five will be cost of living, taxation, and then parks and trail, and growth management, housing, and infrastructure. Um, yeah, surprisingly that the food security um, was uh, probably the, I think that's the least uh, de-emphasized got de-emphasized in the whole <laughs> whole discussion um yes well i think i think what's what's important to mention is you know that so so rasana is the the food charter from 2017 um we've got a food security consultant um as part of the team so while it's not it's not a top of mind issue for most people as a priority area the way housing affordability and recreation are um it is linked to a lot of these things so uh, while it's not a, a priority item at this point, I think it's a good, um, you know, it might be one of those areas that can grow into those non-residential um, uses as well. So I don't want to write it off entirely, even though it's not, you know, a response from the general public is a priority issue. I saw this a hands up there. Kathy? Oh, right. Yeah, Dirk, it looks like. Yeah, just that. Uh, food security and community safety, safety are two of those things that we really take for granted until we don't have them. So it's a human nature and a thought look that far. We've had that discussion before. So it's, yeah, important. Totally agree. Exactly. It has to stay in there for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Um, so this one is the this question number three, specific issues that people wanted to highlight. Again, this affordability and housing. I wanna mention it here that uh, affordability, um, that's two key words actually associated with it when we do the search. So uh, it's affordability plus cost of living. So we kind of combine those two words under, um, under affordability. So uh, can we go to the next slide? So here, so that's that's basically is what's the topic that people want us to kind of uh, uh, have more conversation about. Um, so for development, for the second one, I understand that housing is always there and development is all showing up in combination of the words like economic, housing, community, um, or planning. So uh, we combine those uh, as a development that people want to know how development uh, explore there. It's interesting that taxes falls way down when they're here. You know, it's like, yeah, they, they, wanna, they want lower taxes, but they really don't want to learn anything about what their taxes get them right now. It, it is curious that it, infrastructure is higher than, than taxes. That's very, uh, it's not well, typical. You know, but I think Partly that's our community conversation. We've talked about yeah. infrastructure and asset management in Roslyn for quite a number of years. So I think we've got our population somewhat conditioned to be thinking about that as, a, as an issue, which I'm really happy to see. If you'd asked us that probably, you know, eight years ago or something, that it wouldn't have come up as high. That's great. Got it. Yeah, let's go to the next one. Yeah, what's the best way? So this is helping us to kind of put our uh, PAP, like engagement plan together. So uh, this is the best way that they feel like uh, traditionally, you know, always online survey is the most popular one. And then goes to community events like open house and, and that. So that's that's actually also uh, already in our uh, planner anyway. And then the other one is informal pop-up event with Brosland, so CPA advisory committee members. Uh, we, we somehow, we do have a few slides about that after this, um, but just let you know that we kind of thinking about that and that will be our or supplementary um, uh, engagement activities. So let's go to the next one. So yeah, the best way, that's also helping us to kind of uh, trying to confirm that if what we are doing so far, uh, how we get to people. Sorry, Stuart. 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 Yes. I just wanted to suggest that um, doing online consultation and asking people how they want to be reached probably is going to bias them towards online consultation. <laughs> point. Yes. Here we go. So, uh, so the best way, uh, sorry, best way there, to keep well, resident. Oh, there, go there, there, there are some, there, there will be other, other mediums, of course, for I just, um, yeah, scattered. Absolutely. No, I hear you. 
<laughs> yeah, how we kind of uh, make people be interesting and join the topic to this guest for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, the best way to keep uh, residents informed, that's really uh, not a surprise. Like um, uh, Stacy helped us to, uh, for the newsletter part, send it out. And then this um, uh, newsletter, dedicated newsletter, that's definitely something. And the postcard uh, that we kind of uh, sending out in, uh, what's that, March? Uh, sorry, at the beginning of January, that seems they, they are happy with that as well. Um, so that's a few. And then there's a website, always, um, social media. Okay, uh, can we go to the next one? That's, here we go. Um, <laughs> this is another one we can laugh about. And this is also, we did that keyword search, that's where you come up with. Um, yeah. So under COVID-19 scenario, maybe hard to achieve with the food and snack. Um, we will see when we finish the draft um, document and then uh, there will be another round of communities of which that will be, I believe that was after summer in the fall-ish. And we'll see how that goes in that at that moment. I think we, we can look at some some ways to maybe entice with food and snacks with, you know, COVID safety protocols. We'll try to figure something out yes. on that front. Okay, next, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, again, this is something that um, other, other themes, sub-themes there. So don't want to be another whistler and keeping a small town feeling. Uh, that's, we heard about it many times, uh, manage, management, uh, managed growth and education tax, uh, tax show up again. Uh, rental and housing for seniors. That's, uh, uh, that's another thing that we noticed that. Can we go to the next one? Um, so any questions, sorry, any questions about what we just has discussed with a uh, preliminary survey before we move on to the engagement plan? I think okay. it's great. You got 334 people to participate. You know, that was, yeah. that's good. That's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. And hopefully we do, uh, we, we will have more for the comprehensive survey because that would be something we really get into the meat of the uh, OCP there. Um, so, okay. I, I, want, I want to make one comment, one comment that I read in the, in the, the, all of the comments that people made. There were so many people who said, what was said, you know, do you want to be involved further or something? And they basically said, yes, I want to be more engaged. So we've already sort of seeded the field there of people who want to participate. And they were like, yeah, just let, just ask me kind of thing. So that yep. was good. That's great. Yeah, I will. And I, we also like to enjoy that postcard, postcard that we sent out. It seems really getting people's attention. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Andy had, had a question. Just, just one other item, uh, a suggestion there is, is counselors... Uh, standing at Ferraro's and handing out prompts has been quite successful in the past when we made that effort. Great. Right, the video there is pretty good. Um, yeah, so, okay, so let's move on to the uh, PAP, like uh, engagement plan. So uh, again, this is, this is a uh, relatively high level documents that we kind of tailored saying how we're going to communicate the message to the community and also uh, the roles and responsibilities and point of contact for each like the stakeholder and for each agencies and that have as they had a role in this OCP. Um, and then also the communication between uh, Rosland and WSP is how we work together on that. Um, and also some uh, in, uh, primary, like the most important engagement activities and key messages. But this is just, um, I think the next slide. Uh, so the, the report, the plan itself is really about high level statement there and to confirm some roles and responsibilities. And the appendix A, I'm not sure if you really dig into that, is a list out for all the activities that uh, we will have. Uh, in in this whole process, but I will have more slides. You you already can have uh, seen the slides. Then uh, you will see there's a more detailed activities that we uh, list out there in the other slides, the tables and charts. Can we go to the next one? Yes, key messages. 
again, uh, it just some of the, this is key messages that we would like to deliver to the community. And some examples is more uh, about Rossland as a city with rich history and heritage and that where people can play and enjoy the outdoor throughout the season. And then there's uh, also, uh, the city has conducted a lot of uh, planning process, like the, a lot of studies uh, since 2008 OCP that uh, from your background report that you've, you've seen that. Uh, Nala was that like 30, 30, 40 uh, documents that we have been reviewed on that. So it has been, it, it's big success, I would say. Uh, really uh, haven't seen that in other municipalities, I have to say. Um, it's really good. Um, and then also there will be uh, the OCP offers the opportunities for the community to look at the long-term growth and sustainability and uh, also future ready, like that whole uh, climate change lens and all that discussion there. Um, and then also this whole OCP process uh, provide the opportunities for the public to become more involved and share thoughts uh, in the next coming years. So this, there are more additional me uh, messages in the document, like the PAP, that ad address the nature of an OCP updates, deliverables such as branding, uh, as well as more uh, process related info. So uh, I won't just list out it here. Yeah. So uh, for we basically follow on this IAP to spectrums of public participation. Um, like for, for the whole project, we're talking about, yes, we inform, we uh, deliver uh, clear information to the, to the community and then uh, provide the details. And we can look at this as a fact sheets and also websites and open house. That's how we in, inform people in this whole engagement activities and then consult, right? So consult that including the public comments, focus group, survey, stakeholder uh, workshops and public meetings. That's, that's how we kind of deliver the message. And then we try to uh, get their feedback from people. And involve is more um, about workshops and deliberative like polling, the live polling that we will have in the workshop. So it's just try to work directly with the public throughout the uh, uh, process to ensure the public issues and concerns are understood and considered and incorporated into the uh, preparation of this OCP. Uh, in terms of the other two, uh, other two category in the spectrum, the collaborate and empower, uh, we normally will see that more after we create a document. Then there will be further implementation on some of those uh, policies and strategies. And that's where that collaboration and empower will, will be in place in that. Sorry, next slide. So this basically, uh, this is just the two category that we're trying to kind of summarize what the PAP activities, like engagement activities that we planned out. So there's uh, some activities with stakeholder and some activities with the public. So stakeholder focus group on the key uh, OCP topics. And then there will be also workshops with advisory committee. Uh, and also there's another visioning workshop. Uh, this one uh, is most likely with council as the key stakeholders. Uh, so we will come to you, I believe by the end of March, um, sorry, sometimes in April, the end of March, April-ish, that we will, that's almost to uh, the end of the engagement uh, activities. That, so in, in that workshop that we would like to kind of let you know what we heard so far and also understand more issues about visioning and is the key stakeholder involved will be uh, council um, on that and, and key staff. So that's the, that's the workshop. On the public side um, is, yes, we will have a, another round of survey. Uh, and then there will be a other, uh, uh, there's a round about public open house launch event, uh, idea fairs, roundtable uh, sections about each OCP topics. Um, and then after we've, uh, we had a draft, the uh, OCP, then there will be another uh, community event for the community to uh, understand what we dropped and then understand uh, and then provide their comments. So that would be, uh, that would be in the fall. 
So that's for the public one. Um, yeah, thank you. So this is a little bit more detail about what we are looking at in the, what we have done so far and what we are looking at for the, uh, for the next steps there. So in March, we're, uh, we're scheduling stakeholder focus group. And then there will be another workshop with um, uh, advisory committee about affordability and growth options. It will be quite similar to what we had discussed uh, today about those questions and then definitely with a lot of the further details. So for example, uh, okay, if we wanna kind of uh, confirm that we might need some growth, then where is the most appropriate place for new growth and infill and uh, greenfield development, that types of discussion. So we'll get further on that. Well, can I just interject for, I think we'll, we'll take a lot of the comments that were discussed today and obviously oh, work, that, work that into to what we present to the, the city and advisory committee on that topic. And uh, honestly, so what we have discussed today, what we heard today will definitely help us to tailor uh, further questions going to advisory committee about growth. Um, so we believe we got a general uh, guidance there, direction there, that we can build on more questions about it. Um, for, for example, like uh, uh, land use, how, how, how we are going to plan the land use to facilitate the growth. Um, that's, that's one of the, uh, and also infrastructure. I know we didn't touch a lot about infrastructure today, but infrastructure is, is a big ticket item. Um, and you would all say, what types of infrastructure do we are looking at new infrastructure? Uh, are we going to up, uh, upgrade what we have so far? And what's the plan there? So that's also the topic touch asset management. Uh, but anyway, I won't go too, too far about that, but I just hope that if you're interesting and feel free to join us for that discussion. Um, and also uh, in, Sorry, I, uh, could you go back to this one? Thank you, Rachel. Um, in April, there will be, uh, yeah, the, the survey, the, the long, the more comprehensive survey uh, will be released to the public in uh, later. And then uh, engagement launch. Yeah, the, the big uh, engagement launch open house will be also happening in April. Um, so in May, we talk about, we'll kind of summarize our, uh, what we heard report. And the supplementary uh, engagement, most likely uh, like with AC committee, um, most likely will uh, happen in April because we, at the end of March, we probably have a lot clear idea is what topics that we want uh, our uh, advisory committee to help us with in terms of like a supplementary uh, uh, event. Well, we talk about some um, pop-up stands and also uh, iPi kiosk, kiosk and that has of idea. Okay, um, yeah, it may that um, we will have our what we heard report and then visioning report. So the visioning report is more about our recommendation and based on what we heard and our recommendation to the uh, OCP. Um, so we will have another presentation to you after that, after we develop that report. So the key recommendation will go to the OCP there. And also growth option is one of the com uh, part of the component of that report as well. Um, yeah, so that will be further after we draft the development and, uh, dr sorry, dr after we draft the OCP, it will go to the public for uh, engagement. That will be in fall. Um, okay, uh, can we go further? I think I just have a very few slides there then. Um, yeah, this is just, uh, uh, we, we talk about COVID, um, so sorry. yeah, so that's all right. So this one's the uh, the community engagement, as Chen said, will be conducted online March to April. Um, the advisory committee, we've got some plans for supplementary on the ground engagement events. So uh, the vision tree on the right side of the screen is an example. So that could be placed somewhere in town, and uh, you know we'll we'll have people using stickies or some other other format to to put their ideas up and so uh trying to get a bit 
you know, creative with iPad kiosks and things like that. The ideas that the advisory committee came up with. Um, so we can go to the next one. Um, the rest of the slide, just further details. I think we kind of, if we're pressing in time, we can just quickly go skip uh, this few slides there is how we kind of schedule for the next two months about the detailed workshops. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, and this is also kind of a repetitive, the, uh, this is the next step for the, uh, uh, for March and April. I believe that's the last slides we have. Mm -hmm. And any questions, comments? Council, anything? It was a very good presentation. Thank you. I think everyone feels way more informed than they were before. Does anybody have anything else for the consultants right now? Nola Chen, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time and uh, come you. back to us with any questions that you have. If you want full council feedback, we're always willing to help. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Kathy, and uh, all the counselors appreciate it. And discussion was very good. So your, your time's valued. Thanks. Now we're going Thank to take you. a ten-minute break. Stuart, did you did you want to raise your hand? Were you raising your hand? No. I was just waving goodbye. Ah, okay. <laughs> Only for ten minutes. Uh, <laughs> ten minutes, and then we will uh, reconvene for the financial plan. Thank you, gals, so much. Thank okay. You. Have a great Have a great ski day and weekend. Have a great Thank day. you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Staff. Well, thank you very much. Um, yes, it was great to put this together. It was a lot of work, but um, I think it really uh, showcases, you know, everything that Rossland is achieving all in, all in one spot, you know. Um, so this plan is different from previous years in that it not only provides information according to the community charter that you see on your screen there, um, but it also tells a story that incorporates um, the strategic plan that's woven into the many layers of the organization. And once we add the management work plan that you'll see on Monday, um, it will even be more so. So this provides an all-encompassing um, all view of the plan at work. Uh, including the financial health, which is something I'm always interested in. I loved pulling out those ratios over the last 10 years just to see uh, where, we, where we stand. Uh, talked about asset management and, um, and some uh, facts on environmental sustainability. And many times this information is presented at different times throughout the year, but I think the financial plan is a great spot to put it uh, so it's all in one place, uh, especially for the public who maybe don't tune in all the time. And if they wanted to see a broad picture of the organization, they could turn to this document and it would give them a comprehensive overview and, and where their tax dollars are being spent. So it's not just numbers on a page anymore, but there's um, qualitative data behind those numbers to show how their money is being used. So moving on to the next slide. So I'm just going to use the, uh, the report as the slide deck so that we can just follow along rather because I ran out of time. I don't have time for a uh, proper slide deck. So I'll just use the report this year. So that might be different next year. Next year there might be a slide deck. <laughs> Okay, and, um, and you know, and from this point on, you know, now that the bones are here, we could, you know, we can make it more pretty, just like, you know, Cynthia did with the strategic plan, you know, before it was just a lot of words on the page and she made those words jump out at us, right? And so really our financial plan could take more of that characteristic as well, um, but at least here we have the bones and we can, you know, we can develop it from here. So this is a quick snapshot. It's pretty small, but you have, uh, um, you can always expand the view if you want to, uh, of the changes to the operating expenditures. And I'm not sure if you want me to review the highlights of, you know, a lot of the changes are uh, reflected. Uh, they reflect inflationary changes or, um, you know, labor increases. Um, some oh. of them are, yeah. 
if you could if you could reflect the highlights and then if council has anything specific they can raise their hand and then we don't have to go through it line by line but just hit the high no, spot. sure <laughs> and then yeah. questions yeah that makes sense so um yeah so like i said um you know the big thing on the general government is the insurance increases uh information technology is going up a bit just we're uh, buying some new equipment that will help uh, identify uh, more of our assets that we're working on this year. Um, then there's, um, you know, environmental health is down just because of those, uh, those Hugo methods uh, that reduce transportation and disposal costs. If, you know, obviously if we run out of room for that, then those costs will increase again, but at least not this year. And uh, planning and development, a lot of those costs are revolve around the OCP. Protective services, a lot of that budget is 100% grant funded with uh, UBCM and, um, and CBT. And uh, we put out an RFP for the uh, uh, web page um, updates. That's part of, that'll be funded by COVID funds. And then let's see here, sewer operations um, is just down. That's really, you know, an, an accounting thing um, that has to do with the requisition from the RDKB, RDKB or the sewer utility. And if we over collect, um, then we put that into a reserve. And uh, just a small change on interest. So is there uh, questions on this operating side? I don't see any. Okay. Uh, so just moving on to the next slide is, um, I put in here the, um, the non-market change for the exemption class and for the inventory. Um, it's a lot of numbers there, but those are the numbers that I use to calculate on the tax uh, rate scenarios. And I just wanted to show you that there was actual documentation to back those things up. I had one weird little question on those things. What is the, there's a $5 million, I, can't, I can barely read the thing on this thing, but. Yeah, that's not, that's not included. It's, I had a funny feeling you might ask me about that. That's, um, and I can't, um, I don't have the exact, explanation for it, but you it's something you exclude in your assessment base oh, okay. when you're doing your calculation. It has something to do with the um, the um, the province, but I just don't have it on the tip of my tongue. Oh, that's okay. It just, was, it just didn't jump out as something I could understand. No, it's something that I always have to ignore because if, and so, um, if, because if I would include it, I would get the tax rates wrong. Okay. So I'm... <laughs> I can let you know specifically on that later on. Okay, well, it's idle curiosity. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so on page 66, uh, unless there's more questions on the non-market change. Looks okay. Uh, this shows the, um, just the breakdown of revenue by funding source. Um, a big change this year is just the provincial grants. So I've built into the budget if we were successful on all the grants, uh, this is what the revenue scenario would look like. Um, just that it's so significant this year that, um, and you know, we have to leverage a lot of those funds. It was just important to show that it was all manageable and, and yeah, that all the numbers worked out. Yeah, Janice. I was just going to ask, is that per that's percentage of total revenue, not percentage of total budget? Or are they the same thing? No, that's just percentage of revenue. Okay. Yeah. And, and we already know that we haven't gotten some of those grants, right? Like the one we went for with the restroom, but is it at the, was this at the total that we'd applied for? Yeah. Cut. Yeah. And then as, you know, if, when I present it again, and if we know for sure uh, that some of those aren't awarded, you know, they'll just drop from a future draft, you know, or if we do, like we already know, um, 
you know, like about half of the grants, like half of the projects. So there's a total of 14 million in um, capital projects. Half of that we already know is moving forward. And, you know, of the other 7 million that's out there that we aren't for sure on, um, we already know now in this last week or two that 1 million is going ahead. We're quite confident that another 1.5 million is going to be approved. And so, you know, those are just, they're, they're big numbers, right? You want to make sure you have the financial capacity to, to carry it all. Yeah. And do you have any concerns about that? Or are you? No, it's looking uh, really good. I've been, um, you know, I've been, while I was doing this, I was also working on the year end. Uh, and when I prepare the financial statements, I get a pretty good idea of where we are you know, with our unrestricted surplus, whether we've dipped into that or, you know, whether we've added to it. And it looks like we've added to it for 2020, just because we there's ongoing projects. And then that always makes it carry forward. So, you know, things are looking really good. Great, thank you. And you'll see that in the reserves too, even though we're dipping, we're dipping into the reserves. Um, you know, if you look at it over five years, you can see that it, it does slowly build up again. Right? Um, and then the next slide, uh, we've got um, just the uh, operating expenditures over the next five years. Just a quick snapshot there for what we knew. And um, it does fluctuate a bit, just depending on um, you know on what on what we know is going to happen, and uh, like in twenty twenty one. And then moving on to financial policies on page sixty nine, just just a summary of what will be included in the um, in the tax rate uh, bylaw. This is always included, and so uh, last year. Um, council asked that uh, we move the tax rate multiplier for the business class and also later on in the year just that um, just put into words that growth would pay for itself and so that non-market change that you saw being calculated for this year uh, I calculated that the same way last year based on the BC assessment reports. Harry has a question. Yeah. Elma, can you uh, give me a little color on environmental health? Again, I know I read it somewhere, but remind me what that is. Environmental health? Oh, oh, oh. That was on the, um, on the expenses. Expenditures. Sorry, I may have missed his hand up there. Okay, so that's, uh, that's garbage and um, uh, cleanup. Okay. Thanks. That's Got predominantly, it. yeah, one of those um, those two things. Uh, okay. Some vegetation um, expenses in there as well. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Waste management is the proper term, not garbage. <laughs> we go with either. We're flexible. Okay. <laughs> Brian's the wordy guy, not me. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, was there any other? Terry, are you still up? Okay, thanks. Okay, so if, you know, if for some reason, you know, council did not want to, uh, if council decided, well, growth shouldn't pay for itself, we want, you know, um, to pass that savings on to the existing taxpayers, then then we shouldn't include that here, right? So, so I want to make a comment on, on that for council. Like this is a committee, the whole meeting, which is we don't do motions, but we do do recommend recommendations. So as as we've gone through this report, if any of you have recommendations that you would like council to consider passing at our next council meeting, you could make that you could make that resolution today if you want to change anything. So if you wanted to change any of these policies, now would be a good time to, to suggest that change. And Brian has his hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly say that this is a, um, this is a draft budget still. So 
any direction that we get from this committee, uh, from this meeting, it will get re, uh, in, put, put back into the financial plan. So when we look at it at the, uh, the next regular meeting, which will probably be the first meeting of April, because we're gonna come back for first reading the bylaw, all that stuff will be included in that. So this is still a work in progress. Yeah, yeah. But if we wanna give any direction, now's a good time. Okay, carry on, Elma. I don't hear okay. anybody wanting to make any recommendations right now. We like our policies. Okay, uh, so next page. Uh, this just gives you the budget uh, timetable. Um, so it's important just to let people know when we're, uh, when we're doing things. And uh, the next slide in, on page 71 and 72 just show you the, the balanced budget where all the revenues and transfers and expenses come into play. Are there any questions here? I'm, I have a little question and this is just a sort of a clerical thing. Up at the top in the header, what does the little two, three, and four mean? Two, three, oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Well, that's because it's a, um, it's set up as a table. And when you uh, put in 2.5 more than once into that cell, it labels it a different way. Okay, all right. Yeah, so it, means, it means nothing to us. That's mechanics for you. That's fine. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll make a note to change that though, because it is confusing. Well, okay. it was curiosity, not really confusing. Okay, good. Okay, any other? Uh, comments on this. So, I don't know, the, a big thing sometimes that's, uh, well, people look at amortization, you know, because you're not really, it's a non-cash expense, right? But so, now that's an estimated amortization on all our assets. And what, what it really is, is uh, we use that to fund back into um, capital expenditure. And so even though you see, if you about halfway down there, you see that line for capital expenditure, it's 14 million in 2021, and it's a lot lower uh, in the next years. Um, it doesn't mean these are known projects that we're doing. And if we're not spending that money on capital expenditures, then it's going into uh, reserves. Okay, so it's not like it's being spent on you know, operating or whatever, it'll flow back in so that when we do need it or let's say a grant project or, you know, something comes up, you know, we can pull on it from our, from our reserves. And I could add too at this time that while we're adding in, you know, 1.8 for um, capital, um, you know, we should actually be, if we were to 100% fund the replacement of all our assets, we should be funding a lot more than 1.8 million, right? That, that, was on, that, balance. that was that balance that we were trying to, to talk yeah, about. Yeah, so that's actually on the next page, on page yeah. 73. Look at all flows. <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, yeah. So this before we, before we go on, Andy's got a question. Okay. So you just mentioned Elma asset management and and the balance there. Um, so as our asset management becomes more clear and defined, uh, uh, our uh, reserves will change relative. Correct. Yeah, if we are, if we keep um, on track with our uh, tax revenues, yeah, and funding programs, right? Right, right. So, I mean, the, the need for reserve is is to plan forward uh, for for replacement of infrastructure. So, yeah. just just to know that I, I'm just wanting. I, I know this is the plan. Is the intent is to get a better idea of our our assets. Uh, and their lifespan and life cycle, et cetera, and then manage replacement and calculate that all out over the years uh, so that we're in a better, better position when it comes to replacements 
and taking advantage of grants and stuff too. But uh, I know the challenge right now at regional district, for example, is, is not being in a place yet where our asset management, uh, we don't have enough information to understand how much reserves are, you know, important to keep in, uh, in, the, in a budget and, and to keep back. So I'm looking forward to the, you know, I guess you never, you never can plan for everything, but, but at least uh, to know that our plan process is at a place that we have a really good idea of what, how much money to continue to hold on to and plan um, that'll, that'll be held in reserves so that, that projects can come up and, and we're in a position to replace. Well, we're going to get to some more slides on that that, that shows yeah. our level of confidence and all of that when we, when, when we get there. Good. Okay. Thank you. Well, like these numbers here that you see in front of you, they were numbers that were provided by the consultant uh, a few years ago. And um, what Barry's been working on is uh, looking at our assets that we have in our asset register. And we have a replacement cost for those that we got from the consultant and seeing and then comparing uh, what we have in our asset register um, and if we come close to these numbers. So that's what we're working on right now. Um, so what we provided in this plan was just on, um, on the health of our assets, like at what state they are in uh, as to their useful life. Um, and then, but also along with that, we're looking at when do they need to be replaced? And, uh, and so we're trying to get some more confidence in that data um, before we rely on it. Um, so it's just, a, it's a work in process. But yeah, that is, the, that is the goal. And that is part of the reason why we're hiring that co-op student uh, in the summer uh, to help, um, you know, get, get more assets into the register on the storm side because we notice that there's some gap, uh, some gaps there. And then, you know, as for, you know, do you want to 100% fund, you know, all your future assets? Like that's not really responsible either. Like people, people should be paying now for the assets that they're using they shouldn't have to also pay for the assets that somebody is going to use 30 years from now. Like, you know, I'll be dead by then. Why should I be paying taxes on something that, that, that they're going to use then, right? So it's about finding a balance between um, all those numbers. And also there's, you know, right now there's grant funding. There might not always be grant funding, but you would hope that you would use a combination of your reserves, um, use grant funding and debt to to uh, to replace your assets. That's the those are the three things that you need. So once we have more confidence in the actual replacement uh, value of the assets and what we need, um, then we can use those numbers to develop a longer term financial plan that goes out, you know, 25 to 50 years, but doesn't just look at uh, operating expenses and reserves, but also looks at our statement of financial position. And that's where those ratios come in that I gave you before. So we have like that debt ratio, and then we have those, um, those financial health ratios. And you would use that and use those ratios, build out your statement of financial position into the longer term, and then try to find the right mix between debt and reserves um, and, and your um, uh, grant funding, right? What you need, what's the optimal mix you need there to keep your ratios in line. I don't know if that makes sense, but like that's how you would look at a long-term financial plan. And we're not there yet, but that those are best um, uh, best practice asset management uh, considerations. And then the other uh, thing that you need to look at here is with the council choice of 37 and a half percent, like extending the, oh, well, we're gonna go with this number here, extend our uh, life of our assets by, you know, 
But what that also does is it increases your risk, right? So then uh, you're going to be, um, the, you're going to have disruption of service potentially. You're going to have emergency call-outs. You're going to have overtime. You're going to have increased maintenance costs. So maybe not for every asset, but um, there, this doesn't talk about the risk of going into that longer term, right? But that risk definitely is there. Yeah, but, but that was the conversation that we had a number of years ago was saying you, you strike that balance between like having no risk at all and having too much risk. And that's why council chose that 37 and a half percent, because we felt that that was a tolerable risk. Like we're willing to have some call outs and some overtime, but not all the time. Right. No. And that's why like now we're starting to. Uh, we want to measure those call outs and those emergencies and know where they're happening. Right. And so that's why we have started to track that data. And, um, and then that'll give us information on, you know, which areas are at a higher risk than others, because depending on the type of ground that the infrastructure is in has a effect on how that asset performs. Yeah, and staff could always come back to council and recommend a different uh, scenario, right? With different yeah. with different numbers, if we feel we've been too conservative or too aggressive. Yeah, yeah. Once it's just I just wanted to say that you know it's a, when we look at these numbers that uh, there is that risk component as well. It's not I didn't write it in here, but I just wanted to bring attention to that because not, not everybody was there at that. Meeting when we talked no, about I, I think it was the previous council, in fact, wasn't it? I think, I think yeah. it was probably just Andy and I were there. So, yeah. But the concept is good, right? If the service life is, we'd be investing $3.7 million every year to if we just went with service life and we're trying to make our, our assets sweat a little bit by pushing them a little farther, that's, that's where those numbers came from. Stuart. Yeah, I mean, if we had perfect information, we'd be able to calculate exactly the most efficient time to replace everything, but we, we don't have that yet. That's right. Okay, so um, the next page, I've got a priority table. This is new. Um, there are just so many projects, I thought it would be helpful to uh, categorize them. So that's someone who was looking at it maybe for the first time. Um, they might understand that, you know, not all capital projects are equal. You know, some are definitely more important than, than others. Um, not that you would want to, you know, they're all important, but they do have different levels of uh, priority. And then the next... Um, slide there is just, this is a question council often asks about our liability servicing limit. So I thought that would be helpful to have in the plan. So you can see that that's moving in the right direction and within uh, the policy framework. And, um, and then let's go to page, um, were there any questions? Then uh, going to page 76. Well, I just included some of these, uh, some of these ratios. I included uh, quite a few of the ratios when uh, presented the financial statements. Uh, Elma, your voice is breaking up just a little bit. Yeah, it's still caught here. Excuse me one second. Very. Uh, I included a lot of these ratios um, in uh, it, when I presented the financial statements in uh, last year. And so I thought it'd be helpful to include just a few of these in the financial plan. Uh, so you can see the trending over time. I think they they all look quite good. Uh, there is there any um, comments on any of the next few? I had I had one question on condition. What were the options? Is it it's 
there's one that's fair, the rest are good. Could it be super excellent, excellent, terrible, disastrous, or what's what are, what's the range that you judge by? Oh yeah, that's yeah. good. Should we be happy with good? Yeah, I think good is uh, is like I think there's uh, five levels, and that's probably the you know that's probably the second highest from the top. Okay. Yeah, and they're they're subjective, right? Like. Um, if you had a policy, okay, that addressed where you wanted these levels to be, right, that would be like next level, right? You decide uh, as a council, well, what are we happy with? What, what, do, what are our goals, right? Um, then you could define those ratios with the different conditions how council would perceive them, right? It's, um, but we don't have that. So I, they're subjective. They're, you know, it looks good to me. Um, and that's why I included, you know, what, what's the indicator story and what's a healthy indicator and what's a warning indicator. And if I saw that it looked healthy, I thought, well, that's good. You know, if it's somewhere in between, well, maybe it's fair, right? Fair is kind of middle of the road. So that's, it's based on, it's just a one word condition on what the healthy in, healthier warning indicator is telling you. Uh, Terry has a question. Elma, so uh, yeah, this graph, um, access to liabilities uh, is, is certainly pointing in the right direction. Is that, is that just a, a consequence of us paying down debt? I was, you know, looking down, I mean, we're still paying down Columbia and um, Washington, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Most of so why is this thing ticking up like that or, or getting that much stronger? Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right, right? We're paying off debt. We don't have a lot of debt. You can see that with the liability servicing limit. Um, we have quite a bit of money in reserves, right? So that's what's putting it in a net, in a, in a healthy uh, net asset position. There's lots of municipalities who are in a net debt position where it's below that, uh, you know, it's below that one number. And, um, and it could be that all of a sudden they, they've taken on debt, um, you know, for a big project. It doesn't, debt isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just debt has to be managed. It's like me taking a mortgage out for my house. You know, that makes more sense than me renting in the long term, right? And that's kind of how you have to look at uh, debt within a municipality as well. It just, it's not a bad thing, but you should, it should be managed, right? So you're, you're right in saying, yeah, it's a little bit because of the Washington and we're paying it, we're paying it down, Washington, Columbia. Yeah. And, and the fact that wow. our, res our reserves are growing as well, that, that affects that graph as well. Is that right? And that's exactly right. Because okay. that, um, all those reserves are being held in and cash and securities, right, in your assets. Great, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I think 2012 also represents where we did Columbia with no grant money, right? So we had, we took on a lot. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's go to page 80. And this just shows our trending uh, over time in capital investment. 2021 is going to be an interesting year. See what happens there. And then we go into the next page as some of the asset condition based on remaining life that Barry has uh, been working on just to give council a snapshot of what the condition is. And then that gray uh, bar in behind, I really wanted to include, um, like some things are definitely estimated in the asset register. And I didn't think it was right to just show the condition based on uh, remaining life because some of it is not, is not accurate. Right now, so that's why we include that percent confidence. And then that hope is that 
you know, okay, this is an area we have to work on or pay attention to, but it should change and become more positive over time. I think those are excellent charts and including the percent of confidence really gives us a lot of information too. So that's super. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, without that, you think, oh, well, okay, we know exactly. But the truth is, is we don't know exactly. And by doing that, by integrating that percent confidence, that's what brought my attention to, um, you know, the storm, the storm line assets, right? Um, which is the, on page 83. Stuart has a question. Yeah. Just on that graph we were just looking at, um, and the confidence, I mean, that's confidence over the overall. I mean, presumably we have a lot of confidence of the infrastructure that's been replaced recently, and we probably have very low confidence about stuff that, you know, is potentially in poor condition and that we haven't assessed. Is that 70%, that 70 is an overall calculation of our confidence or is it supposed to, am I reading this incorrectly and it applies only to the, to the less well-assessed things? No, it's overall. It's okay. overall. So we replaced a lot of um, assets, right, with Columbia and Washington and Spokane, sure. right? So those, you know, that's really increased our confidence in those areas. But it's over. It's overall, and a lot. Some of it we just won't know, right, until the ground is dug up and replaced. But don't we know some of it from the cameraing that's been done? So even though we we may we're, we have we're you know, we're 72% confident in this assessment because some of those pipes we've looked at, even though they might be in the, in the poor category, we know they're poor. Yeah, I don't know how much of that Barry has uh, updated, whether he's integrated that into the, into the GIS or not. Okay. But, and, uh, and is I this can... also based on age? of the actual infrastructure? Is that, is it, that's a sort of a guesstimate, just knowing that, you know, we have water lines that are 80 years old still under some streets? Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, if it was 80 years ago, um, do, you know, we're guessing at what that material of that, of that um, you know, pipe is made of. Um, we're, you know, it's just more estimation the older it gets, right? They had paper records back then, not, you know, computers. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, and then I included a section uh, 84 on uh, environmental sustainability, uh, just to give some um, information on, on uh, things that the city has been doing and, and then giving in the appendices uh, just some uh, information that comes from the CARIP reporting. So we, rep you know, we report um, all our energy into their, it used to be called smart tool, it's called CGRT now. So all those graphs that I included on how much energy we're using, they all come from uh, that tool. And I, I kind of just dumped um, it all into the report without any explanations, uh, just, just because time was a factor, but I thought that it might be interesting for, um, for you to look at and uh, and then you know as time goes by we can um, we can add more commentary on the things that we're doing uh, in different facilities or in fleet uh, to address those areas. I think it's great to include that especially since we're trying to get the 100% renewable goal you know plan so it's good to have that especially if we can get some of the public to to look at the report you know to look at the plan financial plan. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we, you know, we do a lot of inputting, but, uh, well, some of it's automated, but then we never show what we get out of it, right? So it's nice to, it's nice to include some uh, information. I mean, just, uh, uh, Stacy was looking at it um, the other day, on the, and um, for some work she was doing, and she noticed that the water treatment plant 
uh, natural gas was a lot higher and it made her ask, you know, the guys there, hey, how come your natural gas is this much higher? And they say, oh, we, we need to talk to Scott about this thing that's going on. I don't, I don't remember what it was, but, you know, by having that communication through the organization, because they can identify areas uh, that maybe we, you know, there you go, full furnace identify areas that need to be addressed, right? That's perfect. In the conference I was in yesterday, the siloing about climate change, that's one of the things they talked about was the importance of cross-departmental <coughs> communication. So that's a great real-world example of it working. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, and then um, I have a glossary of this odd information. And then we've got um, the tax scenarios. So this is where uh, I could use some um, direction on where you want to go. Uh, we can look at the capital budget now if you want to, or we could talk about tax uh, scenarios now or later. Um, you know, your choice. I, I, think, I think that's fine. Um, does council have any preference? Okay. Uh, One reflects the other. No, well, why don't I get my thing over and done with, and then you can uh, talk about uh, what you want to do. Why don't we jump to jump to um, page ninety six? So what I did here, this is a listing of all the capital projects, and uh, just a quick summary of uh, what they are. And if they're in blue, uh, we're waiting to hear from the funding source whether they're approved or not. I, I had a question on that. Um, was that, you know, I'm wondering if all of the, the discretion or most of the discretionary um, projects should be contingent on grants. I know these are ones we've actually applied for, I guess, but I'm wondering if those other ones, just to sort of separate them out from the things that we really need to do, is that we, that we say, well, if it's discretionary and we don't have other source of funding lined up for it, we should really focus on getting grants for those things or, or maybe not proceed with them, just as a thought. I don't know what anybody else thinks about that. Well, there's not that many that are discretionary. You know, it's basically um, the museum, the skate park, and uh, the tennis courts that are discretionary. Uh, we put money aside specifically for the tennis courts over the last few years based on a council motion a while back. Whether that's going to be enough money or not remains to be seen. Um, and the Rawson Museum, well, we're contributing uh, about $30,000 towards that project, but a lot of it's funded by, by tech. And then we're just waiting to hear about the rest for the um, on the grant portion, uh, I think the museum has put aside capital uh, fund money for that as well. Is the skate park that talks about um, funded by community and donations, is that money they have in hand or are they fundraising for that? Well, it's money we have in hand. We get people, oh. the community is very pro yan yeah. And so they uh, have open pockets. So every once in a while I receive you know, envelopes of money that's specifically for, <laughs> for the you're end. Not, you're not dealing on the side, are you, Alma? No. <laughs> envelopes of money, that sounds suspicious. It sometimes feels a little odd, but, um, but yeah, so that goes into a separate, a separate fund, you know, because, okay. yeah, okay. so that's what that is. Okay. Good. And, and the Yan, um, you know, the skate park features, that was identified uh, by the Yan, um, Yan people or Yan surveys, that that was a, a top priority item, right? Okay, um, Andy has a question. Uh, can, in this chart, uh, a bit of confusion could I could see is that uh, we don't mention the contribution of the city of those discretionary projects. So it kind of looks like, oh, that's project is a city project and it's going to cost the city 2.2 million dollars and and i'm wondering that final uh box there on the right can we put in you know that what our contribution would be towards that project again um, just to provide 
more information for public? Yeah, it's a little uh, uh, cumbersome. I think like that's why on the individual sheets, like for each one of these lines, there's a specific sheet um, that tells you the justification behind the project and where that money is coming from. And uh, sometimes I'm a little bit challenged by space, right? Because, uh, so I needed to break out the information uh, in, uh, you know, in different schedules, if that makes any sense. It's a good idea what you have there, but um, I would run out of room. Yeah. Yeah, because like the museum outbuildings, that 98,000, that was basically from insurance, wasn't it? That's Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, I, see, I see Andy's point, because if a member of the public is looking at this, they're going through, oh, my tax dollars for this, my tax dollars for that. And, you know, but yeah, we understand the need for space too. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, you want a snapshot of what that 14 million is uh, for. But if you really, if you're really interested in knowing, you need to go down into the detail because it's not just one source, right? I'm dealing with, I'm dealing with, you know, many sources, right? Not just, not just the one. Terry has a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Point of clarification. Back to the yen. So, so do we? Did somebody come up with an envelope filled with ten thousand dollars, or is that's the price of the project, or what was the what was the community donation uh, that that we have in hand so far? Is it close? Yeah, the community uh, donation is almost ten thousand dollars. I rounded it up uh, just because um, ten thousand is the um, is the capital threshold for the TCA policy. We figure so, out, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, ba um, yeah, ba thank you. Back to Andy's point. Um, uh, yeah, I'd love to see this. Uh, to me, that sounds now like it's a required thing. Like if it's a $10,000 project and somebody gave us $10,000, it, it, it feels to me like it falls out of the um, category of discretionary. But And again, uh, so that's one comment. And the second would be that um, yeah, if... Uh, if that's from donated money, um, again, I'd love to see, like Andy said, uh, a note that says, um, you know, cash reserves from donation or something. I don't know. Christine, but I, I, I hear your point about the, the devils in the, in the details later, but uh, from a visual standpoint, that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah I think uh, it would be, then I would take this schedule out completely. Um, you see, oh, if, you look at page, no, if you look at page uh, 51, if you go to 51, page 51, or even just saying, um, please refer to page 51. Oh, sorry, 101. Sorry about that. Okay, this tells you the funding sources of all of the capital. But the problem is, is that this doesn't show you the description. Right? So like it's, you know, there's only so much room, right? Well, so Yeah, maybe having that reference on at the top of that would say, go look for the details or something. I'm gonna call on Christy and then Stu. Um, I think maybe there was a little bit of misunderstanding about that donation money for the Yan Skate Park. It, it is discretionary funds. It was donated in, in kind of bits and bobs over a couple of years through things like the, um, um, what is it, uh, ski bum bingo and things like that, or, or the tip jar at the brewery. And then it got to a large enough amount that it was, um, you know, Elma sort of saying, okay, you need to start spending this. So we actually approached the Yan um, because the skate park had been identified as one of their priorities um, and asked Holly to check in with the youth to see if they would want to use those funds for some of those street features. But it wasn't an identified project that people donated where the funds have to go to that. It was discretionary. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Stuart. Yeah, I don't like the way it's conflating core city operations with, you know, these things where we're acting like a flow through for these groups. You know, I mean, I appreciate that, you know, the museum's on city property, but this is a museum initiative with funding from other sources and having it all sort of mixed in together. I'd, I prefer these sort of, 
sort of arm's length things were all sort of broken out and identified in a separate way. This makes it look like it's, you know, core to our functioning and it, and it just isn't. Alma, do you have a comment on that? Well, you know, when you build, it's, it's going to be, it's an asset that's going to belong to the city. Okay, so let me, every year is the museum and it's important to show because um, you know, we're responsible for that asset. If we build, if we, you decide to build onto it, then there's, that's going to come, there's going to be additional cost in future years. I'm not sure, like, you know, same with the skate park. You, you put money into the, into, you know, building the features on the skate park. Well, you know, that's another thing that come, goes into your own capital and something that has to be maintained. And, uh, you know, maybe labeling them differently, or, you know, we could separate them out so they're on a separate page, maybe, but they all come into the city capital. Especially for the maintenance stuff, operations and maintenance part of it too, right? Once it's, once it's ours, it's ours. So. Okay, any more questions on these uh, sheets we've got here? Comments? No. Okay, um, is there any questions on any of the specific projects um, rather than me go through each, each single one? Is there a specific, any other specific projects you want to look at? Well, I had a question about the, the resort municipality ones because it seems like the reserve that we have currently, I, I think it was 120, 120,000 that was set aside for RMI projects and then there's way more than that anticipated. And I see another another tranche is gonna come into that, but I'm just wondering how that's gonna work. Because it was well, like, yeah. All of, those, all of those projects have already been identified and it's all funded by RMI funds, just the RMI funds, you know, they come in, um, you know, annual allotments and not a lot was spent. Uh, last year, so there's a lot to do this year as we get closer to the end of the agreement. Okay, okay, all right. I just didn't see where the money was actually there for for everything they had anticipated, right? But I might well, not. there is a um, a reserve schedule mm -hmm. on page 137. Yeah, and there's a separate line for uh, RMI on line number uh, 14. Well, that's what, yeah, that's what I was looking at, right? Where it said there's 120 mm -hmm. in there. Yeah, yeah, but there's money going in and then there's, so at the end of 21, or 2021, the balance is 49,000. Right. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess I would, yeah, okay. So in the green, the, the green 100,000, that's new additions coming in? That's correct. Okay. Okay. I I, yeah, I guess, that, I guess that makes sense. I mean, that's, it seemed like it was adding up to more money than was going to be there at any point in, in the fund. But I'm not going to worry about the financial management of it. You are. So go for it. Yeah. Sorry, just a quick question on that one, or a point of context on that one, is that we develop a three-year resort development strategy. And so the, well, how we do things now is we take that money, we know what the three-year plan is, we get money from the province, we hopefully that our revenues are proper because that's part of MRDT and some other things with the RMI projects. And then we kind of, this is the way that we financially account for it. So there's a carryover, but we have a dedicated three-year plan with revenues and expenditures that add up to zero. And then now that we've taken it on from the city perspective, we just keep it in reserve and then there's a draw from that. So it all works out in the, the longer term and it just year to year, it would fluctuate based on drawing from reserves or uh, allocation of what we get from the province. Okay, great. Chris, you have a comment or question? Uh, yeah, we considered uh, the shortfall in RML fun RMI funding in the next year or maybe two based on what COVID's produced. So, yeah, so we have, um, we're guaranteed a minimum amount of funding now. And so the prog projects that we have developed and the RMS that we have developed is the bare minimum. So we are guaranteed 
the money regardless as base funding. And then we've collected a little bit more than we have because of MRDT. So we actually have in our reserve um, from the first two years of this new RMI uh, projects with the RDS um, program, we have probably between thirty to forty thousand dollars extra that we have to basically have surplus in that in that fund. But the RDS basically we try to schedule that and plan for that for minimum funding. So yeah, that's taken care of when we do the original plan with um, Tourism Rosland. All right, thanks. Good. Um, anybody else have comments on any of the the project list? I was curious about heavy vehicles, the 105 and 107. It sounds like we're getting two $242,000 behemoths. Is that is that right? We're getting two similar vehicles? Yeah, one, one was from uh, last year. It didn't come through. So sometimes it might look like um, it's more inflated, but it's just carried forward from the previous year. Okay, but it's still two vehicles, one last year and one this year? Or it's just one vehicle carried forward? No, it's two. Okay. It's two. One carried forward from last year, so makes two into okay. this year. Okay. And then there was a light vehicle replacement, and, and is that that's one that's up at Public Works, and is, it mentions that it's possibly a hybrid. Could it possibly be an EV, not a hybrid? Yeah, Another. it's being researched right now. Yeah, good. Okay. Ford's supposed to come out with an electric truck. That's what we're looking for. So. <laughs> Hope so. Okay. Anything else, guys? You have anything up there? No? Okay. Alma, carry on. Okay. Well, that, um, you know, the next sections were just our, our progress on the um, asset management uh, readiness scale. This is um, an 8.6, like page 147. This is based on FCM's um, readiness scale. And then uh, what so, we did. Can we go to that page? Page uh, 147. Yeah. Yeah, those were great. Yeah, so this kind of gives you an overview of where exactly we are according to the FCM uh, framework. And uh, one of the things that we're going to be looking at is the three uh, year roadmap, three to five year roadmap. You know, we've completed a lot of the projects that were on the list. And so now we really need to focus on, um, you know, developing more shovel ready projects for, you know, for the years ahead. So that's um, something that we'll be, we'll be working on. Yeah, I thought those were really helpful, helpful kind of guidance documents. You know, I hadn't seen, I hadn't seen that before laid out like that. So that was good. You know what, I realized I did have a question on the water fund. Um, and it was just, are we doing the critical water star, star dam work even if we don't get a grant? Well, I believe we have to. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not optional. That's why it's critical, right? right. That's why it's labeled as critical. Okay, so, but we have grant application in for that one that we're optimistic about, hopefully. That's correct, yeah. So, and then, um, we took that, um, you know, something that we were working with, uh, um, oh, Stacy might have to help me out here. With the natural assets, we were uh, working on getting an inventory for that. And uh, so they had some exercises for us to complete. And they were kind of following FCM's uh, framework um, for this asset management scale. And, um, I thought, well, why not just uh, why not just use the whole scale? So Cynthia was kind enough to take uh, apply the FCM readiness scale and turn it into a um, municipal natural asset maturity scale, incorporating some of the things that we were learning uh, from this natural asset initiative. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And I had a, a note after reading this, I had a, had a note to Stacy about, well, let's make sure we, we get that well in hand in our OCP. And she said she was already all over it. So that's that's great to see. Yeah, I saw that mentioned in the, in the OC, OCP uh, presentation. And, uh, so this is really 
we're going to integrate that's actually on in the management work plan is to integrate the natural assets into uh, our asset register. Yeah, great. Okay, that, so that's all for me. Okay, council, any questions? I was happy to see our EV charger getting uh, more and more use on one of those charts that was in there. That was good. Um, okay, I'm not seeing any hands raised. If there's any other questions, you can put them in email and shoot them off to Alma and team. Uh, Janice, you got something? Well, we were going to discuss the... Um, oh, we got to do the tax? The tax rates. Yeah, yeah, we got to do the tax rates, but just anything more on this whole portion. Okay. All right, Alma, on to the tax rates. Yeah, so that's on um, page... Um, we want to go here. Page uh, 88. So what I just need, I trust that you've read through the different types of scenarios and I'm just looking for direction on um, what you want to go with. Okay, so first what I'd like to do is ask council if anybody has any questions on any of this. And then if we get questions asked and answered, then we can take some recommendation, we can put forward a recommendation, then we can discuss it. Does that work for everybody? Okay, any questions? No questions? It was very well done charts here. Um, okay, if no questions, how about a recommendation? We need to give staff some recommendations. Our plan right now is a 2.5% increase. This, at our request, has provided some other options. Do we want to take one of those other options? Janice. Well, I'd like to discuss some of the other options. Okay. Um, you know, we don't need to make a policy decision, policy change to do that. It just changes the total revenue, how we how we position that. Um, I'm happy with the policy of development paying or non-market change paying for new growth. Um, but maybe our uh, maybe our tax rate is a little lower, so it, a little bit less goes into reserves. And and I'm specifically thinking about um, about the balance between. Um, class one and class six. I think they're a little out of proportion. And uh, over a significant period of time, they've gotten further. There's a further gap between the two of them. I'd like to see us close that gap a little bit. I think it's important because uh, uh, an appropriate tax policy continues to uh, keep our community attractive and retain um, the majority of our taxpayers who happen to be residential. And um, yeah, and I think that, uh, you know, we look at it every year. So, you know, Elma's done an excellent job of telling us what the effects will be if we do make a decision so that we can go in it with our eyes wide open and we can look at it again next year and see where we want to go. I would say that in any normal year, which this clearly has not been, uh, rather than reducing any of our rates from 2.5 to something lower, I would think about increasing some of our non-residential rates um, and maintaining the residential ones, but uh, I don't think this has been a normal year, and I don't think that's a great way to move forward for this year. Okay, anyone else want to comment on that, or uh, Dirk? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm keen to have the discussion of the lower, not the 2.5% uh, this year. Um, you know, we were in a good position last year to carry on sort of with the status quo, but, you know, we're a year into some significant disruptions and uh, that are going to cost us provincially and federally in the future. So uh, I think it's a reasonable discussion to have the lower rates now for a year, see where we're at, what happens recovery wise and etc. Okay, well, for discussion's sake, would you like to offer up which one you were considering? Um, I, th I think the one that uh, I went through them. Oops, how come I can't scroll? I think it was the 1.5%. You know, it looked pretty close to uh, keeping things level community wise without, you know, burden that would hurt us downstream. 
move that up just a tiny bit more so we see the bottom. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Um, okay. So uh, further discussion on the 1.5. Yeah, but just that's sort of a further thing. I mean, in terms of tightening belts, you know, 260 whatever percent or 260,000 is not a big percentage change. So, you know, finding, I know we're efficient and all that, but you know, opportunities always do arise. Okay, and you're looking at the all classes, 1.5 at, at all classes, not separating class one from class six. Yeah, I mean, I feel the same as uh, Janice, but maybe now is not the time to, to bring that balance closer. It's certainly something we got to strive towards, but. Yeah, I think we have to pay attention that our businesses have been hurt in the global pandemic. Um, counselors, Janice. Well, the only uh, the only thing I would add to that is that um, Elma provided us with a chart where she went through and she worked out uh, what had happened with the taxation for uh, for the average assessed business uh, since 2012 to 2019 before we changed our tax policy. And you know the businesses were paying an aggregate difference of two percent over their 2012 taxes in 2019, and so uh, and certainly the residential groups were paying more. So, um, you know, we're not, they're paying 2% more than they paid in 2012, or they were in, in uh, 2019. And we've since added 2.5%. So now they're up to 4.5% more than 2012. Yeah, that's, it's hardly a hit. Okay. Other comments? Stuart. Yeah, I'm not convinced that now is the time to be increasing the burden on our commercial uh, businesses, um, but and likewise, I'm I'm not convinced that I mean I, I think our costs, the CPI is going up, you know, approximately two and a half percent per year. Um, I think our revenues have got to track with that, unless there's some compelling reason not to, and I'm I'm just not seeing that. I'd, I'd say stay the course on two point five percent. Okay, uh, Chris, you're muted. First one, there I am. First one I, that you muted. <laughs> God, you think we were getting practiced at this? <laughs> we are. Um, <laughs> uh, I and you know I, I I agree with closing the gap a bit between commercial and residential, but I also agree with the fact that um, this might, might not be the year. Um, helping our residential burden is is important, I think, to all of us. Um, and then. But our plan has been built on accepted increases already. So what are we willing to sacrifice with the decrease in revenues? I don't like seeing red numbers anywhere. Um, you know, how exposed would we be if, if something were to, were to come up? We've got large workloads. We've got big grants that we have to fund and some capital plans coming up along with a, a big build, hopefully for a new uh, city hall. Um, so as we move towards incentives to attract some economic development in business, um, I don't know if uh, a large increase in, in uh, business taxes is, is prudent, but I, I do believe in closing that gap. Okay, so I'm gonna ask staff to comment on, on Chris's concerns about you know, what, what the risk is and what are we giving up and those kind of things. Well, I would say that whatever, we can cover operating, right? The way the operating is now. Um, what this has an impact on is capital. So you've already seen that there's, you know, there's a capital gap. And, um, you know, so that's what this will affect. This will affect the money that goes into reserves to fund capital. And that's really the bottom line. It's not going to, you know, we're not, you know, there's no need to take anything operating off the list. Um, if you've said that, you know, growth should pay for itself, um, you know, it's, you know, that's where it's going to, it, it's kind of going to take some of that money out of that extra growth number that you've got over the long term. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Unless, yeah, it does. 
unless you decide that there's something you want to cut, right, to make up for it, right? You could decide that too. Say, well, if we're not going to, we're going to give up 130,000, um, you know, then what can we cut out of out of the operating budget for 130,000? Right, Janice. Well, I would say that, uh, you know, and, and it's referenced in the presentation in 2017, the city cut $200,000 out of the operating budget. And uh, we didn't do that by reducing our purchasing of paper clips and notepads. We did that by, um, we did that by reducing accessibility to services to our community, or we provided less or, or, or any which way we, we've already, you know, restricted or reduced our operating costs in 2017. Um, yet, you know, it's, uh, and we continue to put money into reserves over that time. Um, so, you know, the only people that are, uh, the only people that are really sort of losing here are, um, are our community. So I'd like to see us be able to, you know, and, and you've done a great job. It's great uh, to be able to look at these numbers and actually know how we're going to affect this. Uh, I don't want to do something detrimental to the future ability of us to continue to provide the high level of services that our community enjoys. They obviously like it and it's been successful for us. Um, so I am sensitive about what we take off the table over the course of the whole year's plan. Uh, you know, I also noticed that things are changing for us. So, you know, we are looking at the full 2.5% plan or at our, you know, our moderate, it's a very moderate tax increase to be perfectly honest. Um, and I, in no way do I think our tax burden is unrealistic to uh, currently. Um, but, you know, with our growth, um, with our natural growth, we're actually significantly above forecast for this year. And we don't know that we won't be even more above, for we could be below or above next year. We don't know. No, no uh, crystal balls, unfortunately. They don't ship those out when you get elected or even become a staff member. Um, but, uh, yeah, but we, uh, you know, I think we have the opportunity here um, to move a little bit and, you um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's that gap just seems really as a residential taxpayer, mm -hmm. that's not just as a counselor, but as a residential taxpayer, that annoys me a bit. As a counselor, though, I think it's important that we uh, look forward and make sure we keep the whole community in uh, good shape fiscally going so, forward. So Janice, Janice, are you advocating to stay the course at 2.5 or are you saying no, no the 1.5? I would actually like to uh, I would like to discount or discount or reduce the uh, tax rate for the residential. I don't think that uh, I don't think staying the course at 2.5 is a big hit for the uh, commercial or other properties, other classes um, at all. So, you know, I think that uh, the residential class has gotten us where we're at. We're in great financial condition and, um, you know, we're, we're seldom able to do something for them. Uh, they've been, continued to, to invest in our community. They are 95% of our taxpayers. And, uh, you know, I'd like to see them have some benefit from their investment. Okay, so you would be at the 1.5% uh, increase for class one and keep the others at 2.5. Just... I'd even be okay with the 2% increase for class one and the rest of them at 2.5. A half percent differential between the two would be fine with me. The gap didn't occur in one or two years. We can't expect to fix it in one or two years. So that's, it that's, has to be incremental and uh, not onerous to any other, any of the property classes. Okay. So, but also giving some acknowledgement that we've been through a global pandemic and maybe there's a bit of leeway because at this point, we're just talking about for this year, right? We're not correct. changing our plan. It's just for 2021 that we're looking at. Okay, yes. let's, hear from, let's hear from the other counselors who haven't spoken. Uh, Terry. Yeah, I, th I think um, uh, I like the idea of um, acknowledging um, what the world is going through. And, and, and again, in light of the pandemic, uh, a one, uh, I'd advocate for a, a one and a half for that uh, class one. Um, and it's... It's, I know it's uh, more than symbolic because it would uh, affect our reserves, but if there was a time and place to do that, um, this feels like um, 
again, this is more politically motivated than anything. I think, uh, like Janice said, it, it acknowledges that uh, there's probably some people on the lower end of the socioeconomic program that are really paying attention to this. And then there's the, the folks that are continually harping about um, taxes, uh, rightly or wrongly. Um, it, it feels like the time to um, claw that back a bit. That would be my thoughts on it. Okay, we haven't heard from Andy. We haven't heard from Stuart, who's still there without his video on. So hopefully he'll come back. Andy. Oh, I'm, I'm leaning that way as well. And I think that uh, it, it probably would be a good time to, to drop it back a bit. And I know there's an effort to, down at the regional district table as well to keep things somewhat manageable. Some of the budgets have coming in at, at as low as 0% increase this year. Now, not overall, but but some of the individual service budgets. Uh, I'm happy to, uh, for this year, um, recognition of the pandemic. Uh, and, I, and I agree with Janice, let's keep the others at uh, the 2.5. Okay, Stuart. I, I think I already spoke on this, but I-, oh, I You said 2.5, I'm I sorry. I said 2.5, I, I, don't, I don't see people have taken a hit. I mean, my, most people in our community are, their income has been unaffected and their costs have gone down. I think people are flush with money and buying stuff and having a good old time and why don't have things to spend money on. You know, I, I mean, we can, uh, it seems tokenism to give people a discount on their taxes this year because I don't think the need's there. Well, it, it might be, but I am, I am somewhat interested in the 335 people who, who answered the survey and said taxes are still their like number one thing, which points to two things. One, either they are hurting and they're not necessarily the people in your circle, your bubble, um, or they're uninformed, which is why we want to get Janice's uh, tax, tax pony show out there um, to try and help Educate, help educate people. So, so I, I, I think I've been slumming it as much as anybody, Kathy. I just know that the government's been throwing money around. You know, I know lots of people that were paid all summer for doing nothing and they yeah. didn't have to go anywhere. And, you know, I mean, these are people up and down the socioeconomic spectrum aren't doing that badly in Rosalind at the moment. Um, you know, I think we've got a, you know, all sorts of challenges at the, at the high levels of government, the amount of money they've been, you know, they've basically been spending more than, people have been suffering. There is much, we are flush with money and we are looking at, you know, a real estate boom and rising housing prices and, you know, as a consequence. And that's the, that's the stress that I'm hearing. People are freaking out because homes are, you know, selling for $900,000 in town. You know, this is, this is, this is people's fear. It's not their personal financial circumstances. It's the overall trends in the community that's disturbing people. Well, but that but that does that's that that's only an issue unless you know if they're trying to buy or sell. And what is an issue is if their house has gone up is to seven hundred thousand dollars from two hundred thousand dollars, and now they're paying taxes that we set the rates on. Their taxes are going up. Um, I want to ask Chris a question because I think you're most connected with the business community. I mean, Stu's saying his his people that he knows are are doing really well. Would you say the same for the for the business community? Well, it depends on the business. Um, you look at companies that are in town like Thought Exchange and, and the liquor stores and Ferraro's and the uh, pharmacy. And, you know, I, I think that they're all surviving. I know that Butch Boutry's had, had an exceptional year. And, and, you know, but then you look at the tourism-based stuff. Um, I know for a fact that the restaurants are suffering. I mean, you go to rafters where normally your shoulder's a shoulder and you could, you could hardly see somebody across the room. Um, so do I think that, that we're being impacted? Yeah, for sure. But I also kind of agree with Stu here in that, you know, our community, I don't think is being as, impact, as impacted as, as, as others. Um, I think that we're quite affluential that way. Um, I, I don't think a, a decrease in, in already accepted taxes is going gonna, is gonna to benefit us. Okay, Dirk. Yeah, I, I think <clears throat> I'd agree with Stu on one point of that the, the government has been throwing around money, but that's something that will cost us, you know, next year or the year after. So that's not a, it's a temporary boon. And I think that the, 
to, to Chris's point, we haven't suffered as much as some communities, but certainly there are those in the community that are struggling with this. So, you know, finding a balance between status quo and, uh, you know, tailoring to a community that may have been struggling uh, puts us in a nice middle ground balance. So, you know, one and a half for residential, because I know people that have struggled uh, in this. There's lots out there. Okay, uh, Janice. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with Stu that, you know, I don't think that our, uh, necessarily the majority of our community is, um, especially our residential community is necessarily suffering and may even have a little more disposable income because they're not going off places because none of us are. Um, but I think my thinking is more to do with um, the state of our city financial position. Um, and what we've done for our community. And um, it doesn't really have to do with whether or not people can afford it or can't afford it. It has to do more with uh, their investment in the community, getting us to this very, very, you know, fiscally stable position. And, um, you know, and, and we're all suffering in some ways. Sometimes it's not financial. But just because we're generally an affluent community doesn't mean that every household in the community is affluent. Yeah. Um, Dirk, you have your hand up again or just? No. Okay. Okay. So I've heard three different scenarios here um, for that we could make as direction to staff. One is that we take one and a half for class one residential and leave everything else at 2.5. One is that we stay the course 2.5 for everybody. And one is that we go 2% for residential, 2.5 for everybody else. So it, does anybody have anything other than those three as ideas? Okay, so since this is committee of the whole, I don't I think we don't have to really do motion and second. We'll just, I'm just gonna ask for a, 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 a show of hands. Um, who wants to keep it all at 2.5 across the board? Raise your hand. Okay, that's, that's one. And, oh, Chris, are you up there? Chris, too? Okay, you can just raise your hand physically if, because I don't want to, or, or do you want to speak, Chris? Okay. Okay, so two people for 2.5 completely. I, I'm thinking that one's not going. So let's try uh, one and a half percent residential, 2.5 on everything else. Who's for that? That, okay, it's this one, two, three, four. Okay, well, there you go, there's four. Um, but just to see, let's go 2% and 2.5%. I like that one. <laughs> okay, so I think our direction to staff is that 1.5% for residential, 2.5% for everything else. Everybody good with that? We're making that recommendation to our next council meeting or whatever, however staff wants to deal with that. Staff, you okay? Yeah. Uh, could, we get a, could we get that in, a, in the form of a motion, please? Okay. I'll make that motion. Okay, Andy makes it, and Dirk seconds it, and... <coughs> Can I speak to it? Yeah, sure. Uh, could I... Uh, I know the impact report, but from, from a public uh, meeting standpoint in our next council meeting, could we have the impact, uh, exactly the impact of suggesting a 1.5%? Um, that would be great. I think it would just help to clarify that. And if anybody has any uh, input between now and then, I'm kind of keen to hear that too. Okay, so you are you talking about just the, the page out of this report that shows yes. the one and a half percent? Yeah. And and then with two and a half percent on the others. Yeah, okay. Okay, all good. All, all in favor for that resolution moving to our council meeting, we're all good. Okay, all right, anything else? Anybody have any other comments? Staff have any other comments? Okay, look at that, 104. I think we can adjourn our meeting. Bye, everybody. I need to go skiing now. Quick, quick. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. See you all Monday. You betcha. Thanks, all. Staff yeah. as well. Yeah. Thank you.